October the 26th for 6 p.m. So verification of a quorum. Yes, we have a quorum. Uh, confirming posting of the agenda. I can confirm that. Any announcement, any changes to the agenda? Uh, no. I just... And we had the spot for B is already on here to talk about measure. Well, it's going to be under the homeless. homeless okay. Yeah, and we can add that. I mean, we're going to talk about under the homeless initiative, we're going to talk about the uh, possible sales tax measures or tax measures, excuse me, to increase, um, excuse me, recertify measure H and um, and possibly the housing trust, the regional housing trust. So that's there's new information that we just learned and we're going to be talking about that this evening. Thank you. We're under public comment. We have several culture public work. comment. And our first one is Holly. Thank you for bringing the uh, diagram up. Uh, good evening. My name is Holly Osborne. I'm a re registered professional engineer in the state of California. And I gave part of this talk at the Planning and Programming Committee, but I had to speak in one minute. So I'm going to get to the band just a little bit. But I want to thank the, the all the board people who wanted more input on the green line. And, and in particular, I want to talk about this section. And there's a steep embankment at one side, and this is actually where the road narrows to 75 feet wide. It's normally 100 in Lawndale. It narrows to 75 feet wide. And um, this part of the road was never shown on Metro tours when Metro conducted them, nor was there a sketch in the DEIR. During the Metro-led walks, you could only see a flat road. New tours need to be comprehensive and not hide the difficult parts of the road where there is not enough room to build. The illustration, which I modified to show the steep embankment, shows a wooded a steep embankment on the east side of the row in Lawndale. It's so steep that BNSF built retaining walls years ago to stop the erosion from the house properties onto the tracks. BNSF also extended property lines into the road to build the walls so that the house would not be so close to the embankment. So BNSF built that wall. This was not a property owner that was encroaching and built it. BNSF built it. And there's pipelines right up to the wall on the uh, property owner's side, okay? If you didn't have those that wall, when the next time you had a big rainstorm, the um, dirt would all wash down. And it has done that in the past. And that was installed in the 60s. And the pipeline I found out from Florence Logistics when they came out was also installed in the 60s, but I don't know which was the chicken and which was the egg. To install the LRT, the cliff and bank would have to be totally excavated. It is doubtful that the LRT could fit within the allotment of 39 feet. You can see there, the um, well, you can't see it there, but the LRT takes 31 feet and you've only got 25 feet left after the place of the embankment where there are pipelines, okay? So, uh, okay, now I want to, I just want to say something about which I'm very upset. This is one of the toughest properties to build. And this is also where the homeowner has really protested and he has received personal harassment from people at the top. And I'm respectfully asking that you find out where it's coming from and stop it. Because people have still hoped up to his property and said, I'm from Metro and what the, I can do whatever I, on your property, and today he they spray painted blue spray paint and got part of his wife's car too. So I, yes, I'm getting emotional. I, you, I don't know. I'm a Holly Osborne. I know you're in the top. I know you wouldn't tolerate this kind of behavior. So I'm personally asking you to do something. Three hundred one. I gotta stop. I'm glad to meet you. And here's a picture of the row of that steep part. I hope it. Everybody can see it. All right. Thank you, Holly. Next up, just so you everybody know, it's a three minute for your conversation and your uh, comments. Um, Brianna Egan. Hello. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, my name is Brianna Egan. I grew up in Redondo Beach, um, and I'm lucky enough to still call the beautiful South Bay my home. Um, and growing up, I always thought of the South Bay as a car dependent suburb until I learned that we used to be a streetcar suburb. 
and many of our neighborhoods in the beach cities and downtown Torrance were built around passenger rail until we paved over the rail and built massive roads for cars. Now we're seeing that that was a mistake and we have an opportunity to undo that and work towards improving mass transit in the South Bay with the Sea Line extension to Torrance. Uh, there's a wide consensus that the South Bay would benefit immensely from this transit line as an alternative to the 405, a convenient way to get to LAX, and with further connections to Santa Monica, downtown LA, and one even one day Hollywood and Long Beach. Um, it would bring people to jobs and homes, reduce vehicle emissions, and integrate into our bus systems and bike lanes. We need this built. Um, and I shared with uh, you all about some other public transit services that we have in the South Bay, including the um, the Torrance Transit 10X, the Gardena Transit 7X that shuttle people from the South Bay to the SoFi Stadium, as well as the LAX Metro Airport connector that will be opening in 2024 and gives us an opportunity to get to LAX without ever having to, uh, to drive again um, into LAX. Um, and Metro also plans to extend the K-Line up to the north uh, to Mid-City and Hollywood. Uh, the C-Line extension to Torrance will be operated as part of the K-Line so this means that South Bay residents will eventually have a one seat ride to Hollywood. Um, and I also have also shared with you a Metro report on the headstone discovery and the pipeline anomaly um, that's along the Metro right of way and the project maps for the C-Line extension so that you can stay for informed about the route options. Um, uh, in South Bay, we voted yes on measure M knowing that it would make this project possible. And we asked Metro to study Hawthorne Boulevard um, and they studied it, and um, it's going to be a full $1 billion more expensive than the right-of-way options. Um, so uh, while I don't oppose Hawthorne Boulevard as an option, um, I don't see a clear route to getting it funded. And these major capital projects require federal, state, and county funding, which takes mm -hmm. years to acquire. Um, and our representatives have brought us to $1.5 billion in funding, and that already took decades. So further delay will only make costs rise. Um, but it's not just about funding and convenience. We also have a chance to make capital improvements to the corridor itself, um, to the freight corridor, and address the concerns of the neighbors. So the right-of-way alignments will add new grade separations and modern crossings for both freight and light rail to prioritize pedestrian safety. Um, the light rail will also upgrade the aging pipelines, modernize the drainage and stormwater control, and build new walking and biking paths, and many other enhancements that would uh, not be built if Hawthorne Boulevard is selected. So I ask that you uh, stay realistic about the funding needs. Uh, we can't please everyone. You and that we ask the tough questions you about- ask Brianna, you're at the okay. end of your- Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Alan, you're next. Alan Nation. Can you hear me, Alan? Alan, are you still there? Your hand is up. Don, he disappeared. All right. Matthew, Matthew Lawrence. Okay. Everyone can hear me okay? So. Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Lawrence, Torrance resident for most of my life, went up to school at Davis, studied civil and environmental engineering, and coming here to speak to you today about the Sea Line extension down by the Torrance Transit Center through Redondo. I'm hoping you'll support the right-of-way option. Um, Brianna brought it up previously. The Hawthorne option is going to be adding a $1 billion price tag. I don't know about you. I don't think we have a spare $1 billion lying around. I'd love to have that for investment in the South Bay, but I also want to be alive to see this rail project built. Um, Janice Hahn's been talking about it since before I was showing up to these meetings, and I'm hoping to see this project brought down here at some reasonable time frame. There's a lot of infrastructure problems. There's things with the ground that folks will bring up here tonight. We have engineers at Metro. They know what they're doing. I'm not going to lecture you and tell you that I know more than Metro, more than other experts with decades of experience. I'm just here to say I support the right of way option and I hope you'll support that too. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Next would be Ray Holler. I'm Ray Holler. 
Lawndale homeowner and retired aerospace engineer. And uh, I've come to talk about the Green Line extension and uh, hopefully uh, provide some information that will, you will find uh, useful. Um, the, uh, you'll notice that uh, neither of the speakers who just, who just spoke did not say anything about one word, ridership. And as our special guests tonight, CEO Wiggins knows I love to talk about ridership because the ridership for the Hawthorne Boulevard path is 35% higher than for the, the road path, any of the road paths. Now, uh, the only in the, in the project objectives in the GEIR for the Green Line, the only project objective that talks about cost is to provide a cost effective project. And cost effectiveness has previously been uh, defined by Metro as being cost per rider. So it's not just about cost, it's about cost per rider. Now let's talk about cost. Because what I did here is I, it was an August 14th uh, update to the uh, Green Line uh, project. And I, I pulled the uh, schedule for, from that to put uh, the four different options here. You got row, you've got a hybrid row trench option in Hawthorne Boulevard. And the row has been de uh, described as being, I describe it as being defective. Metro says it has um, a significant and un unavoidable uh, noise impact and has uh, an emergency vehicle of uh, 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 delays that must be fixed. And the way to fix that is to go trench under a couple of streets and that's how you get hybrid row. And they gave a cost for that a new at $2.23 billion. Now, uh, I've said previously in this meeting that the uh, construction cost for that fixed, that, that you know, that uh, so, so Dr. Oswald calls a mini trenched uh, 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 project is about the same as for the Hawthorne Boulevard. And the reason for that is that when you go inside the DEIR, there are tables. Remember I showed you this table? It has lists of uh, construction costs, uh, uh, tasks, durations, uh, the resource level, and you multiply it across and you add it down and you get a, and you get a cost. And what you find out from those tables is that the, uh, the uh, Hawthorne Boulevard uh, is about 14% uh, uh, more than the, than the row. And when the update to high, for hybrid row was 14%, and that ended up with this construction cost all being the same. So the only difference is that you need something for Caltrans, and I booked twice the uh, the Green Line team, and I put in uh, something for uh, the uh, inflation, and I end up with not a billion dollars extra, but an amount that's 14% extra. Now, so for 14% extra cost for Hawthorne Boulevard, you get 35% higher ridership. So remember ridership, you must talk about ridership. Their numbers, I can't account for $400 million and that's a millennium of labor. I cannot account for it. So uh, thank you for your attention and thank you so much for coming today. I, I, this is great. This forum is awesome. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ray. I love that. <laughs> I'm glad you're <laughs> Chelsea? Hi guys, the kids are downstairs. <laughs> I'm calling you today to express not just my concerns, but the collective sentiments of our community who live along the row in Lawndale. Today, Jay Gold, the man who alerted the community to the presence of a headstone on his property, woke up to find a Metro employee illegally trespassing, marking up his property, and even spray painting his wife's car. He was even verbally assaulted by this employee who said he was from Golden State Water, but was um, it was on behalf of Metro and charges are being filed after he was escorted off the property by the sheriff's department. This action, which is just a small taste of what the community has been dealing with, demonstrates a disturbing form of bullying and intimidation that has been ongoing. We believe that open and respectful dialogue is the cornerstone of a healthy collaborative relationship between our community and Metro. However, the recent actions have left, left us feeling unheard and disrespected. Our community has repeatedly expressed our concerns about how Metro engages with us and we deserve to be treated with dignity and fairness. Um, trust and support can only be achieved through transparency, empathy, and a genuine willingness to address our concerns, which Metro has not been doing. I just ask you guys to keep this in mind while the COG discusses which option they want to support and remember the people who live alongside the row when you make this decision. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chelsea. Alan, you're back. <laughs> Alan. Okay. Nikki. Uh, good evening. Hi, I'm Nikki Negretti Mitchell. 
Redonda Beach, Rida Boy Stakeholder, and I'm a Gardena Mohican alum, class of 77. Mm -hmm. um, this is about the sea line. Uh, good evening. Um, I just wanted to come in and, tonight and say thank you for the much needed public engagement and for allowing us to come in and speak with you all. As a stakeholder in arguably one of the biggest infrastructure projects to hit the South Bay, since I've been alive, I'm sure you can appreciate how crucial that is for us along the and along with the heightened necessity this realistically brings to our South Bay communities at this time. I'm talking about the public engagement. Uh, while I've overheard dismissive complaints about us coming from a couple of people in this room, which baffles me given the circumstances, I want to acknowledge the very sober and sincere support we get, which far outweighs the negativity. My hopes and what I ask of you is to please report our side of these discussions back to the rest of your colleagues in the cities you represent. If for some unexplainable reason you disagree with us, please remember it is still your duty to allow your colleagues the opportunity to decide for themselves how to think about this project. My city of Redondo Beach has been very supportive of us and what this means to our lives. And at the, at the same time, they are working toward better vision. There is no reason to have to settle for the most effective option that would create such risk in so many different ways. We can and deserve to have nice things. Not long ago, I mentioned here the South Bay City Council of Governments report called the 2002 South Bay Rail Study, detailing a discussion with the NSF about the rerouting of the freight trains in the Harbor Subdivision right of way. They discussed it in terms of a linear parkway and Greenbelt bike path could easily be an option. Green to offset emissions and open for a bikeway and walking trail to complete the ideal vision. This was a selling point our real estate agent discussed with us in relation to the home we now own. And it was because of this, our agent did not lie. That report makes the fact that BNSF and the COD discussion took place that was indisputable. I, I can send in the report with my comments later. Metro and the Board of Directors and City of Redondo Beach are working to find necessary funding to make this happen. Both options are extremely underfunded, so let's just stop with the idea that we need to push for what's allegedly cheaper and faster, because it really isn't. And, and you get what you pay for, and haste makes waste. Thank you for hearing me tonight, and most of all, thank you for the support. Thank you. Next up is Kevin. My phone's working now, by the way. Hi, Cog members. Um, Kevin Mitchell, Redondo Road resident. Uh, so last week, I spent three days at the resident of a Lawndale home adjacent to the road. Metro had served the resident with a threat to tear down a retaining wall, dig up his driveway to access a pipe anomaly identified by Torrance Logistics, the owner of the pipeline. Metro was claiming an encroachment to the row property and was threatening to tear down the property's retaining wall and destroy the asphalt parking he had used for his tenants. Metro showed up with a team of roughly 15 contractors and personnel and descended on the property. They were greeted by sheriffs, the city manager, the resident's lawyer, the broadcast press, and a few other concerned neighbors. An emotional exchange netted out with Metro admitting that they were there to investigate potential grave sites that had not been accounted for in the DEIR. This potential had come to light when a month earlier, his neighbor, also a row resident, uncovered a headstone, which became a press story. So Metro surveyed the property on the first day and marked what they considered the border to the encroachment they claim belongs to them. The second day had them bringing radar crew from GeoVision to scan the hillside and search for that anomaly. They identified an area and Torrance Logistics was notified. Two days later, Torrance Logistics came to the residence to discuss a plan of action with the homeowner. Torrance Logistics said that they would need to excavate a portion of the property, that they would return it to its former self, wall rebuild and repave. The story has not ended as we found out today that Metro employee trespassed without homeowner knowledge and or permission to mark the encumbrance and sprayed one of the vehicles. A police report was filed. This, I'm sure, will be an ongoing saga, but it speaks to the need for the community to stand together. 
This property owner has lived his whole life in this location. His father built the house. The retaining wall was built by BNSF and now Metro threatens to destroy it at the homeowner's expense. There are a number of properties that will face this type of assault if the row is chosen for the sea line extension. Please advocate for Hawthorne Boulevard and keep the trains out of these neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Colleen Villegas. Colleen. Phone number ending in. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Sorry. Um, Colleen Villegas, right of way homeowner and advocate for the Metro C Line Hawthorne Boulevard alignment. Thank you to all of the community that came out tonight and have spoken for the Hawthorne Boulevard alignment and the cities of um, Lawndale and Redondo Beach for their support. A project of this importance that's gonna be here for the next 100 years needs to be done right. And the Hawthorne Boulevard alignment puts the Metro down the commercial corridor where it has the potential to increase ridership and revenue for the area while still preserving neighborhood neighborhoods and green space. If done correctly, it could be a model for the South Bay. It will also minimize the impacts and increase the quality of life for the residents. So I'd like to ask you to please support the Hawthorne Boulevard alignment for the Metro Sea Line. Thank you. Thank you. Callers, telephone number ending in 4404. Hi, Alan, finally it works. I... Oh, that's Alan, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the Zoom issues. Um, I'm calling to uh, in support for the Metro right-of-way. Um, I like to echo um, everything Brianna said in the past, specifically saying it, um, it will allow for a one-seat right from LAX to, uh, you know, uh, from LA to the South Bay and, and above and beyond. And uh, also another um, important thing to uh, important thing to realize is that um, if it goes along the right of way, it would also go to the to a major transit center in the area, which will further um, increase transit uh, accessibility in the South Bay, which is severely lacking. Yes. Um, and traffic uh, is only going to get worse as time goes on, and we yes. need a viable solution. Um, Hawthorne Boulevard, while it is very wide, extremely wide, it is also very dangerous, especially for uh, for a train, especially for people to cross onto a center running um, a light rail line, similar to what we have now on Expo in, on the Expo line, but it's going to be a lot wider, and it's going to be a lot more um, expensive because um, it's still at the mercy of Caltrans, and Caltrans can just say no, and the project will be dead. Um, I do understand these homeowners' uh, concerns for the um, for the right of way, but Metro, uh, time and time again, has uh, mitigated these issues. As Brianna said before in the past, they're going to um, rebuild these walls. They're going to um, do everything that's required. Um, these are professional engineers. They know what they're doing, and they were also aware of the grave markers and the remains in the right of way. But um, I feel like that was just a wrench in the cogs to to derail the real um the real topic here and and i mentioned something about having a green belt and to have less emissions well to have even fewer emissions you reduce driving and reduce driving by having the proper uh right of way and proper trains and right now hoffman boulevard is not it and it's incredibly dangerous for pedestrians and um and I, I do recall someone else saying for the this this will be here for the next hundred years if done right. Well, Hawthorne is not the right way to do it. It's basically a freeway. Would you put a train in the middle of the 405? I wouldn't. It's you want to increase ridership. You want to give a good viable option to driving. And Hawthorne Boulevard is not it. Uh, if you want to solve traffic, I'm sure most of us drive here. I drive. The uh, it will be great for everyone. If you want to solve traffic, you don't do one more lane, you do more trains and you, do, you got to do it properly. And um, and uh, that's that's my position on this. And uh, by the way, I live in uh, San Pedro, which is also part of um, the South Bay. And um, uh, just for the record, I do support the Metro right of way option. And uh, thank you for your time and thank you for having me. Thank you.
Last comments by GP G Soda. I let up the last. Got music. Thank you, of course. That was some pretty yeah. nice work. Yeah, well, I knew how he was going to do it. Hello, and thanks for listening to my uh, comment. You took my comment. <laughs> yeah, I've heard about this amazing plan. I've got to say, I'm not a fan. Uh, sending hundreds of trains a day through a quiet neighborhood. Or it may seem a great weight to bend down to keep the sea lines cost down. But the cost to our quality of life here tells me the right of way plan is just not good. If the sea line gets built on the right of way, it'll mess up a lot of people's lives. Hey, if they go ahead and build it on the right of way, it'll see Metro just doesn't care. If they go ahead and plan to build the right of way, with all these people saying it's the wrong way. They should look around and try to find the better way that wouldn't be so hard for us to bear. With the road plan, the tracks will be just feet away from homes where people live and children play, bringing noise and rumbling every hour of the day and disturbance without cease. While just three blocks away is a main street designed to be just right for mass transit needs. That will serve all the people so much better than this row route that'll leave us no peace. If the sea line gets built on the right of the way, it'll endanger lots of people's lives. Hey, if they go ahead and build it on the right of the way, it'll see Metro just doesn't care. So let's not build the sea line on the right of the way. Just listen to what so many folks who live here say, and let's build it the actual right of way down Hawthorne Boulevard. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's a lot of moments. So I'm going to say I've been on the world in the world long enough to have ridden the red car from the end of the line all the way downtown. Loved the experience, was very sad when that uh, possibility disappeared. Uh, and uh, the end of the line at one point was right in the middle of Osborne Boulevard, which was designed for mass transit. And I don't know why anybody would think that a better idea is to shove this down a, a quiet neighborhood instead of on the commercial route where it was originally when we had light rail originally. That's the place where people want to go. They want to go to somewhere where there's a reason to be a writer and to have a destination, like, for example, the corner of RTJ and Hawthorne. That's my thought. Oh, Thank you very much. GP, your timing was perfect, right at three minutes. <laughs> now we're at the uh, consent calendar. So moved. Second. Been properly moved and seconded, David. I would say, yes. Any opposition? Uh, Any? Mr. Chair, I would just abstain from the minutes of the last meeting because I was not present. Okay. You were missed. <laughs> Any other abstentions? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Next up, we have our presentation from Stephanie Wiggins, CEO for Metro. Oh. <laughs> I want to just tell you all that Stephanie is um, not only an incredible executive, but she's also a personal friend. And I've known her for many, many years from, from her work on express lanes, her work as chief um, executive officer at Metrolink. And uh, she is just an incredible person that brings a lot of expertise to Metro. And we're delighted you're here. And now that you've seen how fun our meetings are. I know. Yeah. <laughs> It's serenading every day. I know, <laughs> I know. Well, um, thank you, Chair Hicks and Vice Chair Tanaka and Jackie for inviting me here today. Um, you know, we really appreciate the partnership we have with the COG. It's a very important relationship. 
And while I've been CEO for a little over two years, and this is my first time being here at the COG um, in this role, rest assured, Jackie and I have been meeting on an almost monthly basis since my first 100 days. And of course, I have a long history with the COG, as Jackie mentioned, um, working on key projects when I was with Metro the first time for about 10 years. So I wanted to give you a brief update on uh, what's going on at Metro and uh, specifically uh, how it relates to the South Bay. And then I think we have some people to make some questions. Um, you know, it is really an exciting time to be in transportation. And we are working at Metro to deliver a world-class transportation system for all of LA County residents, including our South Bay residents. Um, it's hard to believe that um, three years ago, three and a half years ago, the pandemic hit, and we've been working to recover from the devastating impacts of that pandemic. It was a shock to the transit system, as you all know, not just Metro, but all of the transit um, operators in the South Bay. And we've been working hard to address those issues, particularly as I think um, a hybrid situation of remote work is kind of here to stay. So many of the things we've been incubating over the past two years are coming to fruition. And I think you're really starting to see Metro come back better and stronger than ever. One area you can see that is in our leadership growth, uh, Ray Holler, who I've become uh, affectionate because he comes to all our board meetings, very passionate, but he's right about the importance of ridership. And so um, for September, we had about 940,000 people on an average weekday writing our system. That's the highest level of ridership we've had since before the pandemic. And our ridership overall for the month of September was 10% uh, higher year over year. That's the 10th consecutive uh, month of year over year ridership growth that we've been experiencing. So we continue to enjoy strong ridership recovery on the weekends, even better. More people are riding Metro to go to concerts like at SoFi Stadium and other places. But we're also seeing year-to-year -year improvement on our pilot go pass program that's our free fare for k through 12 students and community college students that ridership is up 23 percent year over year and people are using our low-income discount program those who are enrolled in that program their ridership is up 45 percent year over year so these are not just seasonal ebbs, ebbs and flows. They are a result of intentional strategies that we've been employing over the last two and a half years to grow our system and make it the preferred choice of writers from all over the region. Now, one thing that we know is a big writer of ridership, big driver of ridership is really safety. And we've been putting a lot of effort into that over the last year. Next slide. Our safety and security programs have changed a lot over the last few years. We've remade our system so it operates with a multi-layered approach to better address the things we're seeing on our system today. We flipped our response from being reactive to problems to be <clears throat> proactive. Uh, we have ambassadors to engage with customers and make them feel more comfortable and confident riding Metro. We have multi multidisciplinary homeless outreach teams to engage with people experiencing homelessness and mental health crises. Uh, to really connect them with services. We have transit security to enforce our customer code of conduct. And we have law enforcement partners, um, the Sheriff Department, Long Beach Police Department, and LAPD that respond to crime on the system. And they we have been working with them to be more on foot and more visible on board our system, whether it's on the buses or the trains. So this proactive data-driven approach is working and we know it's working because, next slide, we have the data. In February, we instituted a campaign to markedly reduce the incidence of illegal drug use on our system. You all know better than I how the opioid epidemic has really um, overwhelmed our communities across the nation. Well, Metro is not immune for what's happening in the broader community. It overflows onto our system. And so, we have been working with our law enforcement partners to target hotspots on our system where we knew the problems were the most acute, namely on our subway, subways, but also on other parts of our system. We've stepped up enforcement of our code of conduct. We also deployed more outreach teams. And as a result, we've experienced a decrease in crime on our system. 
uh, law enforcement increase the number of arrests on the system and increase their visible presence on the system. So of note, crime on our bus system and the lines serving the South Bay cities, the C line, our J silver lines and our K line have been and remain the lowest uh, lines with incidents of crime throughout this whole period. But it's not just that crime is low, people are seeing and feeling a difference, especially when it comes to drugs and homelessness. Next slide. This is data from our Transit Watch app, which is an app that the public, along with our Metro ambassadors, use to report things they see on the system that need to be addressed. And according to our Transit Watch app data, people are reporting fewer incidents of people smoking, drinking alcohol, and doing drugs on our system. They're also reporting fewer issues related to people experiencing homelessness on Metro. So these are all good things, but we know there's still a lot more we need to do to make our system the way we want it to be. So next slide. Earlier this month, we released our customer experience plan to the board. The plan contains over 50 unique actions we will be taking to improve the customer experience on Metro. These actions will make our system safer, cleaner, more comfortable, more reliable, and easier to use and navigate. And to back this up, We've budgeted more than 900 million in FY24 to support these improvements, including over 300 million in public safety, over 200 million in extra cleaning. There are more resources for elevator, escalator, bus stop, lighting, and camera improvements. There are speed and reliability upgrades on both our bus and rail system. And we've expanded customer service hours, signage, and wayfinding upgrades to make navigating our system easier. Next slide. Today, the Metro Board voted to make our ambassador program a permanent program and bring it in-house. The ambassadors have been a very important part of our success over the past year. They are our eyes and ears helping people with wayfinding and just to feel more comfortable in the transit environment. They are not a replacement of law enforcement. They're a supplement of our public safety um, cohort and ecosystem. We're also adding back rail service to pre covid service levels. Our subway lines now run staggered once every 10 minutes. And in December, we're going to standardize headways on all our light rail lines, including the C lines serving the South Bay, to eight minute peak period and 10 minute off peak. We've added more than 40 miles of bus only lanes, and we're taking steps to add more than 60 more miles in the coming months and years. And our cleaning and homeless outreach programs will expand and we'll roll out a brand new public safety dashboard to help us monitor trends and keep all our riders and employees safe and provide more transparency to the public. Now, all of these efforts are designed to help us reach our ultimate goal for the transit system, and that's to become people's preferred choice for transportation in the region. Next slide. We also continue to make great progress on all our projects in the South Bay. I won't go over all of them tonight, but I will provide some key highlights. On the Vermont Transit Corridor, that's the busiest transit corridor on our entire system. Our board approved a contract for a planning environmental study in September. In the meantime, we're looking at installing bus priority lanes on this busy corridor, namely between Gage Avenue and Vermont Athens, the Sea Line Station, and another segment between Sunset and Wilshire to help with speed and reliability. On the 405 South Bay Curve improvements, we're anticipating 95% design submittal by spring of next year uh, on the 105 to Artesia Boulevard auxiliary lanes. And we just started the environmental phase for the 110 to Wilmington Avenue segment last month. We may need to conduct a vehicle miles traveled analysis and, in, and identify potential mitigation. And the construction phase is not fully funded yet, but this project is making progress. And we continue to make progress in planning for the implementation of the 105 Express Lanes project, which will add high occupancy, high occupancy toll lanes in both directions on the 105, connecting with our existing network on the 110. Now we are using an alternative delivery method to deliver this project. And at this point, we are wrapping up design work on the initial segment and hoping to get the project under construction next summer. Next slide. And we're also proud to support and partner with local transit agencies in the South Bay, including Beach Cities Transit, Carson Circuit, G-Trans, Palos Verdes Peninsula Transit Authority, and Torrance Transit. 
We're also pleased to work with you to facilitate tens of millions each year in local return funding. Last year, over $60 million was provided to the South Bay cities, and we're pleased to work with the COG to provide hundreds of millions of dollars worth of transit and multimodal highway investments through measures M and R, supporting transit projects like improvements to the Torrance Transit Regional Transit Center, the Beach Cities Transit Operations and Maintenance Facility Project, the Carson Circuit Fashion Outlet Regional Transit Center Project, and needed improvements to the South Bay 405, 110, 105, and the 91. Next slide. And just today, I'm bringing home the bacon for y'all. Very <laughs> we're pleased that our board approved round three of net toll revenue grants, which will provide 36 million to help support transit roadway and active transportation enhancements in the region. Again, thank you, Jackie, for serving on that evaluation panel. Oh, uh, almost 8 million is coming to the South Bay for transit improvements at Torrance Transit and G-Trans. Almost 20 million is coming to the South Bay for active transportation improvements. And 9 million is coming to the South Bay for roadway improvements, including traffic signal synchronization and fiber optic expansion and upgrades along the 110 corridor. This is on top of the almost 8 million annually that goes to support transit providers, including Torrance Transit and Jeep Trans along the 110 corridors. I'm proud that the Express Lanes program continues to pay dividends for the region, and I look forward to not only expanding our Express Lanes network, but future rounds of net toll revenue grants in the region. Next slide. We're really excited to open our next game changer in the South Bay, the LAX, LAX Metro Transit Center. Construction is going very well, and we're looking forward to opening the project in late next year. 2024, when we will finally have not one, but two light rail connections to LAX with a new operating plan for the C and the K lines. I wanna thank the COG for your input on the C and K line operating plan. It's hard to understate how transformative this project could be for the entire region. LAX is the fifth busiest airport in the world. 66 million people came through LAX last year, and we know that is poised to grow. So when this project opens later next year, you will have people coming into LAX, having a direct ride to the South Bay. And for South Bay residents, they no longer have to avoid taking the call from your best friend that wants you to take them <laughs> to LAX, right? Or your child. Exactly, or your child. Or your <laughs> Next, um, I also want to provide a brief update on the uh, uh, on the Sea Line extension to Torrance project. As the COG knows, light rail extension to Torrance could provide a fast and reliable alternative to the highly congested 405, provide that one seat ride to LAX, Inglewood, and the E Line, connecting downtown LA, East LA, and Santa Monica, and connect to the newly built. Torrance and Redondo Beach Transit Centers. Now, because of the new C and K line operating plan, this will now actually be a K line connection, not a C line connection. This project uh, has been on the drawing board ever since the 1980s when it was a part of the Proposition 8 plan, and it has made substantial progress with the draft EIR being released in January. I really appreciate uh, Dr. Osborne acknowledging that um, our board director your supervisor Mitchell requested that we postpone making a final decision on the locally preferred alternative until more public outreach could take place that she leads to ensure that we really are doing a better job of listening and taking into account all of the potential impacts before we collectively make this very important decision. And accordingly, I appreciate you all deferring, making a, good, making a decision until we can come back to you after those um, outreach meetings take place. So I, you know, I appreciate the comments on both sides. Um, I want you to know that we are listening. This is a very important decision. Um, I intentionally ask that we put up the map from the 1980s, right? Not to not to use the current map with the various different alternatives because it's not about me putting you know, uh, a finger on which alternative we should take. It's about recognizing what collectively generations before us thought this was the type of network we needed to have. I think it's very important in this day and age 
that um, the board hear from all of you. They take into account the voices from the community who are gonna be impacted by this decision to make sure we're making a decision that makes sense, not only for today, but for future generations to come. Because when you think about the investments that have been made over the last um, three decades, you know, Metro as an agency is 30 years old. <laughs> and these investments will last at least 100 years and generations to come. So we recognize that this is a significant decision. And I know there are um, passions on both sides. And I want you to know that I appreciate that and um, really understand the responsibility and stewardship that we have in making a recommendation to the board and then ultimately the board makes the final decision. Rest assured, the board wants to hear from the COG. You know, we did not, I think I heard someone mention that this uh, Green Line extension to Torrance wasn't just a Metro priority. For Measure M, this was bottoms up and it, it first showed up in the list from the COG about what you would like to see investments in. And so when we modeled it, looking at ridership, looking at equity, looking at workforce development, looking at economic development, looking at congestion relief, a green line extension to Torrance, not looking at any particular route, but the fact that we would have a green line extension to Torrance rated very high. And that's why it's listed in the first decade or so of uh, the sales tax measure. So there'll be more to come. Uh, we have not made any, um, any decisions. This is why we have a public process and this is why you're represented on our board both with Supervisor Mitchell as well as um, Mayor Butts, I believe who represents the South Bay region as well. And Supervisor Hahn. And Supervisor Hahn, that's right. You know what, you guys messed me up with this. And Holly Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> I really did not realize, you know, I know the census, but I didn't realize as soon as whatever governing body finalize the map, it goes into effect like right away. So I am still not, it's like whiplash to remember Who's in, who's responsible for what? Us two. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll give you like a few months. Okay. Next slide. Finally, we continue to work hard on planning and implementing our mobility concept plan for the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games. You know, as the home of critical games venues, our work in the South Bay will be key to pulling off this massive, it's car free. You guys know what that means, right? You will not be able to drive your car and park at any of the venues during these Olympic Games. Um, you can only get there as a spectator by taking public transit, walking, bicycling, or getting dropped off, but no spectators will be able to drive and park. But we're very important. <laughs> you are. You are. Uh, it's, you know what? Okay, it's really a security issue. It's not about anything else, but it's the world we live in now, and it's really about um, security. So um, for the South Bay region, they expect uh, the games will attract up to 2 million more people just in the South Bay alone during um, the, those 14 days or so. So we're currently implementing our games mobility concept plan with eight different work streams that touch South Bay communities, covering everything from new routes for games transit, mobility hubs, first last mile, and major projects. I could talk all night on this item alone, but I know that our team, I think, is going to be getting on a future agenda just to come and talk to you just about the games. So um, you'll already begin to see some of the work that we're doing in the South Bay to prepare for the games. Next slide. In August, when SoFi welcomed Taylor Swift for the Eras Tour, Metro pulled out all the stops to deliver world-class customer experience to all the Swifties at our C-Line and our K-Line stations and onboard our shuttles. We even went so far as to temporarily rename a few of our stations to create a surprise and delight opportunity for all the fans. And it went over really well. Ridership on our rail system was 25% higher on ERA's tour dates. And people raved about their experience on social media. People felt safe, they were joyous, and they found community with their fellow Swifties on our system. This is the type of experience we're hoping to deliver with the games. We want people to use our system in the South Bay, in downtown, on the west side, the valleys, all over, to really experience everything that makes our region so great. So Taylor Swift was a practice. You know she's a phenom. 
It's bigger than the Super Bowl. We got better ridership than that Super Bowl a couple of years ago. Oh, um, we're going to see what she's doing for the NFL right now. So oh, God. We're going to be doing a lot more practice in the coming months and years. I think there's a college championship coming soon. You know, there's a lot at SoFi that we can ex uh, experiment with. And, of course, the World Cup in 2026. So, in closing, I just want to thank the COG, Jackie Bacharach, for your partnership over the years. Um, Let's continue our con cooperation, collaboration. Uh, it, it, uh, it's disappointing to hear that people think that we may be a bully or we're trying to ram things. That's not the way I lead. That's not what our Metro board wants to present. So we're gonna be working hard to change that narrative. And the way to do that is to hold us accountable um, so that we can ensure that this is a relationship that one, is born of trust, a partnership, and is a real collaboration for the future that I think we've all decided mutually we share in. That's why we we participate with the Council of Governments. That's why you all are, all are here. And I appreciate your time and attention and look forward to continued partnership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that presentation. Thank you. I, I know some of my colleagues here have some questions, so. Who's first, Alex? Thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you, Miss Reed, for being here tonight. Um, actually, I don't have a question, but I just want to give you a heads up uh, that the Cedar Hawthorne on Tuesday night we vote unanimous to send a letter to support the Hawthorne, the Sea Lion Hawthorne. Uh, we're putting that letter on our thank city council. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I got a um, thank you, CEO Wiggins. Uh, I got a quite, I got a comment and then two quick questions. Um, first, when you described the route for the the uh, the C line extension, you said that it could go to the Redondo Beach Transit Center and the Torrance Transit Center. I, the Redondo Beach Transit Center is in my district. I'm a council member in Redondo Beach, and I'll tell you, nobody's there, and nobody wants to ride the metro to there. And there's no economic development that's going to occur there because Nikki's house and Kevin's house is on one side of it, and there's a pallet shelter on the other side, and there's a living spaces, and uh, and there's a cemetery. So the, this, this state is not allowing us to convert their, their residential area into a commercial corridor, whereas there's great opportunities down Hawthorne Boulevard. So with that said, and seeing as there are communities uh, gravitating towards the economic opportunity along Hawthorne Boulevard, and seeing how it is more expensive and the other alternatives, what can we do as a COG? What can we do as Redondo Beach to help Metro get the money that it needs to build the best alternative? I think that's a great, great question. And I know, um, I think that's Supervisor Mitchell has that in mind as part of having these additional outreach opportunities. Um, one of the things that we can do is make sure we communicate with Jackie and the COG about competitive grant opportunities that are available at the federal and state level for which the Green Line project, extension project could qualify for. Um, one, of the, one of the practical realities when you're looking for extra money to fill a funding gap in the project that you wanna build is you're never as competitive attracting that money before you have an environmental document approved. Environmental document approved, Help, helps provide the state and the federal government a little bit more certainty that people know what the project is before they're going to provide funding for it. But there's no time, there's, you know, there's, there's no time like the present to be clear to our state delegation, um, our federal delegation about the desire to attract more funding for the Green Line Extension of Torrance. But we can keep you posted when grant opportunities come up. Thank you. Yeah. One of the challenges we have at the state is, um, you know, there is a funding program, but they will even say, if your project already has received a previous grant from this category, you can't apply again. It's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll tell you that Redondo Beach had allocated money for litigation before. And since the decision is being delayed for a while, we decided that we're going to, or at least for agenda as a discussion, to move that into lobbying for Metro, uh, hopefully to get some money for this project. And I'd invite you also Monday 
uh, I think it's at 1030, we're meeting with Georgia Sheridan at the new South Bay Social, or the Galleria, so they have a model of the South Bay Social District that they're going to be building there, about $500 million, and I think, um, I, I think uh, he's going to be coming as well, so I'll invite you down there. I would like to, I'm already supposed to be in San Francisco, but maybe <laughs> take a follow up with the team. All right, awesome. Aurelia? Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for the presentation. I mean, obviously, it's information that's been told to us many, many times. Um, I'm going to have to disagree with you on the fact that Metro is a bully agency. Uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, Torrance wants it down one place, Redondo wants another place, Lawndale originally said that they didn't want it at all, but we're never given that option. We were never given the no build option. Redondo Beach was never given a no build option. Even though it wasn't the EIR and uh, all these uh, reports, it was buried in there. But when you look at the agenda items that was brought forward in all the cities, a no build option was not an option. It didn't mean that only a bully would do that. A bully agency that uses taxpayers' money in the tune of over $2 billion. You know this project is going to be in over $3 billion, whether you put it on the row or on uh, Hawthorne Boulevard, and the only reason being, if you calculate for inflation, we're talking about it's going to be way over $3 billion. We can buy a brand new Tesla for each one of those riders and still have a couple billion dollars left over. Okay, This is just a way for developers and the board to make those developers really rich and one project. And I'm not saying it's not your fault, Stephanie, you're just a messenger, you're very sweet, you're very eloquent in your delivery. I, th I think you're very bright, but uh, I can I can tell you right now that the only people that are going to be benefiting from this are the developers and the, anybody that's receiving the $2.2 billion because the community is not going to benefit from this because the ridership, the ridership, which I know those numbers are inflated because not everybody's going to say, oh, here's a train. I'm going to, I'm going to start riding the train. We know that ridership is down. But we also know why ridership is now. Safety is one of the biggest concerns. I got to ride the, the train with uh, Kim Turner. I'm sure you know Kim Turner from Torrance Travis, also another bright uh, lady in the, in the field. It took us two hours and 15 minutes to get to Santa Monica from Torrance. And I can only describe the experience as, as one word, depressing. It is depressing, absolutely depressing. In America, we're not set up. And I know we want to improve public transportation, and I'm 100% behind it. I just got back from uh, Japan and Korea. We spent mm -hmm. 10 beautiful days. Now, you want to see public transportation? There it works. Mm -hmm. But I don't blame Metro. I used to blame Metro. I used to blame Metro, say, hey, hey look, the stations smell, smell like urine and, and human feces, and there's uh, syringes on the, on the ground. This is based on not just on me, also some of the other council members that took rides saw the same exact things, including Kim Turner said the same exact thing. I was right next to her when we were going through the stations. Trash, homeless encampments. And I used to blame Metro. It's not Metro's fault. It's society's fault for being allowed to live that way. It's us, we made those decisions. <clears throat> and I know everybody's happy to move the problem to Hawthorne Boulevard. Have you talked to the small businesses or maybe some of the car dealerships? That project's gonna take seven to what, 12 years? Approximately to build? Mm -hmm. Most of those businesses aren't gonna survive. Those are the same businesses that are owned by people that, your neighbors. Those businesses are not gonna survive. I'm not supporting the row, even though Torrance took a position of, of supporting the row. We were even threatened with a lawsuit. I understand. You're a passionate guy. We were threatened with a lawsuit here at this meeting that if you guys push for the row, Redondo Beach is going to sue Torrance. No, no. No, no. I was there. I was at the meeting. Metro. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Whatever it was. Back to the EIR. But anyways, anyways, regardless, there's not a unanimous consensus behind this. And so I understand your eagerness to move the problem to Hawthorne Boulevard, and I respect you for that. But it's not going to solve the problem. What you should be pushing for is a no-build option. That's what you should all be pushing for. But nobody wants to go against the Metro Mafia. That's what it is. Nobody wants to go against the Metro Mafia because I was at Torrance, and I respect you, sir. I respect you because, uh, you know, you come in and you tell us the facts. But the last time we were at the Torrance Chamber, 
you kind of got huffy with me when I when I mentioned the problems that we have with uh, Metro dumping homeless people at the end of the line. You kind of got huffy, and that's not data that's supported. And and the amount of data, amount of problems that people have been having on the ridership, including murder, which is not a very <clears throat> very common occurrence. I get it, but there's a lot of a lot of issues with safety and Metro and this extension being brought into Torrance. It's going to negatively reflect a lot of communities, and I know there was a <laughs> that uh <laughs> that uh, but I know that not to cut you off, but I know that you already said that you're taking this back to the community. There are going to be more community meetings, yes. so all the the issues and concerns that I know that you're bringing up has already been made by the board. But I understand that process, but to bring that up in that form for it's recorded on their dime, so that they have it in their coffers to understand the process that you're bringing up. So that it gets to the people that needs to see it. No, I understand that, and and I appreciate that hundred percent. Torrance, uh, I'm part, I'm head of the I'm the chair of the transportation committee. We actually got unanimous consent to bring it back to the council to change our position from the row to a no build. Okay, but it wasn't on the agenda this last month. Was it? No, it wasn't because the, it was pushed to to January, and staff decided to push it until December. Okay, but the here's the thing. There's two recalls already started collecting signatures because of my position of concern. I didn't even, I didn't even vote on anything yet, guys. <laughs> A recall has been started against me and Councilman John Kaji of District 1 in Torrance because of his position, his position of concern against metros being extended into our community. Just for that, just, that's based, you know, I understand. I know you've gone through it, but no, no. But what I'm on the rule of thumb that you're talking about, I understand about the recalls. I have never been afraid of a recall. Your vote is your voice, and if you stand on what you believe in, that's what you stand on. The recall effort may happen, but who put you in the seat? The voters that know who you no, are. I, I, I understand that, but I don't, I, I don't want to delay because I don't want the meeting to go no. too long because we're already after seven o'clock, but I just want to make sure that. Stephanie, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for being here. We hear what you had to say. This is, this is exactly why. And that I just want to make exactly sure. why we can't even speak up on this. Yeah. But, no, I understand, but it is the form because we're the cog. And the decisions that are made here, I think, push very strong on, on the board. Yes, they are. But that's why we have the transportation subcommittee. We have different air levels. I understand, but you know, we're the board. If we can and it's okay. I won't speak. I won't speak. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Anyways, I think I got I got my point across. Thank, Thank you. you. The next presentation is the third quarter progress report. I tell you, Perlis, who is our uh, staff member working on this, is going to give you a very brief but uh, exciting third quarter <laughs> presentation on where we are with our recognition program. This is the work you're all doing on energy efficiency in your cities. Are you? You ready? You're waiting for You're the... waiting on David. Your screen sharing. Okay, come in, come in. Okay. David, just get the Q&A and you'll be fine. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, on a very different note, yes. Providing <laughs> <laughs> the third quarter update from the COX Energy and Climate Recognition Program. Um, and since we presented on this program, we'll provide the board we're going to take an overview of the program. <laughs> Straight in more or less, but I have printed the guidelines right there for anybody who would like a refresher. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just to give some context for what you saw on the last slide and what you'll see on the next slide, um, to earn recognition, cities have to complete one activity in these three categories. Um, and in these categories, your city can only earn a maximum of four points. And another thing a city has to do to be recognized is to be enrolled in the SoCal rent, which all but one of our cities is currently in role. Um, and so as I move on to the next slide, you will notice that some cities have the same points, but only one city is earned recognition. And that's just happening because one of the cities who's not earning recognition didn't complete one activity in each category. Um, next slide, please. So, yes, thank you. Oh, sorry, one back. One back. Yes. Um, 
So as of the beginning of October, we have two cities who have reached the goal recognition level, which is Carson and Hawthorne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have six cities at the silver level and two at the bronze level. We have four cities who are very, very close to reaching recognition, and we're looking forward to continuing to work with our energy and climate staff to get those points up. Um, next slide, please. Um, and one easy way to earn points is to submit the city's energy data for our greenhouse gas inventory. Um, and we only have a few cities who haven't submitted the necessary data, which is Hawthorne, just the gas data, um, Inglewood, Caltrade as a state, Lomita, and Redondo Beach. And this data will make a large impact on the way that the can support city. Um, so if you have a good contact from you to reach out to to get this data submission form signed, please let me know. Um, next slide, please. And as some of you may have seen in a recent email, the cause will be hosting a recognition ceremony on December 6th at the Carson Community Center. Um, I've also printed out the save the date, which should be in front of everyone. Um, and we have a large copy that you can take a look at um, before you leave. Um, but it has a QR code, which will send you to a registration form. And we've invited you all, the team managers, our energy and climate contacts at each of your cities along with their department supervisor. And we look to see you all there. Um, next slide. And today we got a keynote speaker. Yes, today we have a keynote speaker, um, Jonathan Parfait, the executive director of Climate Resolve. Um, and so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out um, over email or if they're quick, you can take them or just over email, whatever is best. If you have any questions, Talia is doing a great job trying to get your cities to respond to these uh, really, it's simple but very important measures. So, if you haven't, you know, if your staff hasn't responded, these are really easy points to get. I have to say, but we really need your help. So, um, she's uh, and the recognition is going to be a real fun time. We hope that you'll stop by and 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 join us and uh, celebrate and civic, your staff. Our civic uh, civic Spark Fellow is helping with it, um, Eleanor. So she's, mm -hmm. it's, she's helping to plan it. So it's really wonderful. So thank you, Tony. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Eleanor, for that. Next, we have our housing trust. I think Mike Jenkins is the one that's doing this. Well, yeah, let me, let me give a little introduction. Um, at four o'clock tonight, today, from a year ago, um, we had a meeting at Forum here. We had somebody from San Gabriel, we had three people, uh, two people representing San Gabriel Valley from the trust. And we also had executive director and housing consultant that does gateway cities and, um, and Orange County cities. And they answered a lot of questions on the trust. We actually spent an hour and a half having them tell us how they formed the trust, what they're doing with the trust, uh, things they learned, and um, they were very strong proponents. But um, but we uh, it, there were a lot of questions, and I think people felt really good about the fact that they were able to answer them. Um, that doesn't mean we have all the answers. It just means we had this opportunity. By the way, this is recorded. We'll get it up on the website, and we should send something around because there weren't that many people there, and this might be helpful to you in the future when the housing trust comes to your council. And that leads into Mike Jenkins, because what happened is, is you know we got legislation to do a housing trust, but we don't have any meat on the bones. And the city managers have been working for the last year to do a joint powers authority agreement that is uh, doesn't have a lot of detail, but it has some detail that we wanna talk, that Mike's gonna present, it's gonna summarize for us, and we it will eventually come to your councils uh, before, uh, the next step, I want to make sure I say this, is we have put in for funding from SCAG, which is going to, which has been approved, where we're going to be getting the consultant starting the first of the year, hopefully, that will look at, uh, you know, do stakeholder interviews, talk to developers, look at look at land in the South Bay, find out what the potential is of a housing trust, as well as do an analysis of what the board of directors should look like and what any fees or administrative fees or uh, administrative structure should look like. So that's all coming, but Mike's going to talk about the JPA agreement tonight. Mike, you there? I am, Jackie. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm out there in person uh, tonight. Uh, I, I intended to be, but I currently have COVID and uh, I'm really sorry about that. Um, um, He's gone. We're glad it's, it's my 
<laughs> it's my first it's my first go at it and um welcome and it's, and i'm a little annoyed i thought i thought that i was i thought maybe i would never get it but apparently that that, that wasn't going to happen but i actually feel okay so anyway i i'm sure you you prefer me on the screen to being in the room with you yeah. and and that's that's where i am i <clears throat> I, I i appreciate Jackie, providing you with some of the background. Today's forum was very interesting, actually, and, and I thought uh, very, very instructive in a lot of ways. And um, I, I would strongly recommend anyone who has questions or, or concerns about this um, to take a look at it. It's only 90 minutes and uh, to watch the tape um, because I thought it was was very instructive and the the the, the um, housing trusts that are currently operating and that were uh, represented uh, uh, at the forum as San Gabriel Valley uh, Gateway <clears throat> Orange County are uh, have been very successful at, at what they're doing um, and um, and um, um, they have some interesting things to report. One of them, and I, I know this is not entirely uh, in sequence, but one of them that I know is of interest to some of you um, is uh, something that um, I'd never heard of before. And that was uh, a proposal to um, um, use housing trust fund money to support the creation of affordable ADUs. And I know that there are some cities that have relied upon ADUs as part of their housing elements to get certified. But currently there are no rules that, that require um, that those ADUs be affordable. What in this program was very creative because what they do is they subsidize the construction of ADUs and, and they then <clears throat> require that they be affordable for what is a very modest period of time, this 10 year period of time. And they don't require the repayment of the loan for 20 years, 10 of which are after the affordable covenant goes away and the, and the ADU can be um, brought to market. And um, at that point, they, they actually reduce the, the loan by 50%. So uh, they, they were talking about a lot of very creative things that I think um, are possible, even in cities for example, like Rolling Hills, where um, there's really not um, much uh, ability to provide what might you know, be regarded as typical affordable housing. Um, in any event, um, you know, ultimately you guys need to decide through, the, through some process here um, um, when and whether you're prepared to recommend a, a joint powers agreement to each of your member city councils for purposes of of uh, creating a, um, a housing trust. Um, the JPA is in front of you. It's it's done. The, the agreement is a, essentially an amalgam of the agreements that were done in uh, um, uh, San Gabriel Valley, in Gateway, in Orange County, and in the most recent one, the Pasadena Burbank um, Glendale JPA. I looked at all of them and, um, and I, I went through all of them and I kind of took the best from, from each of them. And so what you have here looks very much like those with some modifications that I think make it a little better and, uh, and some modifications that tailor it to the South Bay. As Jackie said, uh, the South Bay city managers and I walked through this agreement um, line by line over the course of several meetings and um, numerous changes were made to, again, tailor it to um, the South Bay uh, COG uh, uh, cities. And um, so what you have before you is, is not an original work. It's not something that I crafted from from, from whole cloth, it's simply an amalgam of what others before us have done and, and are relying on in their current 
housing trust programs. Um, uh, some of the some of the uh, um, principal points I just want to note: um, um, there's no minimum number of cities that have to um, be involved. Other than well, two cities would be the minimum, but it uh, doesn't require that every city join. So some cities could start it, and then other cities could join later. But um, there was no question in the minds of the, the folks who were um, our guests this afternoon at the forum that the more cities that join, the better. It looks better to uh, the state. It looks better to funding sources. It looks better to HCD that the more cities that are on board, um, the, the better it looks for the housing trust. So, um, but, but, but this agreement does not require any specific minimum number aside from what's legally required under California law, and that's at least two, uh, two members. Um, the first uh, important section is section three, and that section lists the powers of the housing trust, and those powers are um, pretty much laid out um, the same as the powers in all of the other housing trusts that uh, JPAs that I reviewed. Um, and it's important to note that this, the housing trust is for the purpose of financing the development of affordable housing. It's to provide financing to developers who will then collaborate in a public-private partnership situation in the acquisition of land and the construction of affordable housing. The housing trust does not build housing. The housing trust does not own housing. The housing trust uh, facilitates housing by helping with financing. And it is just but one source of many that a developer of affordable housing would need to rely upon to obtain the necessary funding to build an affordable housing project. These housing trusts don't have enough money to finance the entirety of these projects. So they are but one source of funding um, to assist in the development of housing. Um, the uh, section C in, in, in the, uh, uh, or subparagraph C in section three of the JPA is something that I, I just want you to focus on because it's a paragraph called limitation on powers. And this limitation on powers section is designed to assuage anyone who has concerns or doubts about the power or the breadth of power of the housing trust. This subparagraph C is intended to assuage any concerns that any of you or your city councils, your colleagues may have that the housing trust may overreach or over um, extend its authority or impose anything on any member city or impose a housing project on any member city. So what are these, what does the section say? That the agreement does not authorize the housing trust to regulate land use within the jurisdiction of any of the parties. That is strictly a matter for each respective city. It doesn't allow the housing trust to levy or advocate or incentivize the levying of any exaction, any impact fee, any charge, any dedication, any reservation or any tax assessment as a condition of approving the funding for or approval of a development project. So if they want to, if the housing trust wants to fund a project in one of your cities, it cannot as a condition of approval, levy a permit fee or an exaction or a tax. It cannot require or incentivize inclusionary zoning. So the housing trust cannot say to one of your cities, you must have an inclusionary housing ordinance in order, to in order for a development project to receive uh, financing from the housing trust. Um, it cannot require any of the parties to dedicate or assign funding for any housing trust obligations. Um, it cannot fund or approve a housing project or program that is not supported by the governing body of the jurisdiction in which the proposed project is cited. Right? And that's important, right? If your city 
doesn't support the project, the housing trust cannot finance it. Um, it cannot require yeah. the parties to accept or Michael, provide Mike, any Mike, number of Michael, 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 I have a quick question for you. Go question on that, on that, number five. Uh, we have circumstances where the state requires approvals and then you have bodies that don't want to approve what the state is requiring. In that circumstance, uh, what would happen uh, if the governing body didn't want to approve, but the housing trust uh, essentially was teamed up with a developer who had the rights under state law to, to pass, uh, to, to get a development in title? We wouldn't but the cities, the cities, uh, relationship, well, yeah. the, the dynamic between the city, the developer, and the state law is entirely that dynamic. The housing trust has no part in it. The housing mm -hmm. trust would not be able to finance that project. Um, however, I suppose, and, and now I'm, 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 I'm going to step into the uh, arena of supposition here. I suppose if a, if a court order said that the developer had the right to construct the project and that the city had no right to deny it, that that might, might right. be an okay. exception to this section. But I, if I were advising the housing trust, I wouldn't advise them to finance in that circumstance absent a final court order. Cool, got it, thank you. Okay. Um, six, um, the trust cannot require any of the parties to accept or provide any number of housing units as a prerequisite to joining or remaining a member. And finally, seven, um, it cannot affect the individual power of each party separately to implement affordable housing projects and programs generated within its jurisdictional boundaries. So these seven limitations are very powerful and they reflect the limits set forth in the in the other JPAs. I think they're even actually a little stronger because I combined, I, I took I took limitations from all of them. Um, who can, can be a, a member? Yeah. We go, before we go to the other section, Mike, um, <clears throat> I know these are specific limitations, uh, but did you give thought to imposing a, at the end, they're more of a catch all that the uh, trust could not impose any other limitations or restrictions on the uh, powers of any party to the agreement, except as agreed to by that party as provided in this agreement. You know, something that, so in other words, if there's some uh, some other permutation of, of situation that doesn't exist in these seven uh, items that you listed, that it would be covered under that. I didn't, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the idea of a catch-all limitation like that. I mean, I, I don't think it does any harm. Um, these are, these are the existing ones are pretty broad, but I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't oppose the inclusion of a number eight along those lines. Okay. Um, number section four um, provides that um, members must be. Uh, parties, uh, I mean, members Members must be um, uh, parties to the agreement, and the only parties can be the county and the cities within the jurisdiction of the South Bay Cities Cobb. Um, the housing trust would be governed under Section 5 by a board of directors that would look similar to this group I'm looking at right now. One elected official from each member city would be on the governing board. And um, by the way, this is something that is a little different than the other COGS. The other COGS um, boards do not have one-for-one -one representation. Um, there are some city members that don't have representation on the board, but city managers, uh, when discussing this, felt that the board should reflect uh, the membership of, of, the, of, the body, of, the, of the organization. And in other words, there should be a voting member from each um, from each city. And so that's the way it, um, it, uh, it reads. Um, members would serve two-year terms, but there are no limits on the number of consecutive terms a member may serve. Um, section here on meetings, I don't want to go through it in detail. It, it's pretty similar to the your meetings here at the COG. Um, the, the trust has to have a, a treasurer. 
It has to have staff. The staff can be contract staff or the staff can be um, employee staff. And that's an option that is available to the board of the trust after it is formed. Um, the the uh, big question um, is uh, whether or not um, to provide for a mechanism for raising money um, right now for the housing trust. Section seven uh, C deals with um, the subject of uh, whether there should be dues, or I think we call it here fees, to support the uh, administrative costs associated with managing the trust. We need staffing, we need expertise, people who know how to uh, create financing for housing. Uh, one of the speakers this afternoon at the forum noted that um, most cities these days, because redevelopment is a thing of the past, don't have housing specialists on their city staffs anymore in their, in their uh, community development departments. Um, those folks uh, went, went by the wayside when redevelopment went by the wayside. And so there's a need for um, expertise and that there are folks out there who have expertise in financing affordable housing projects. And those people would need to be engaged, whether by, as employees or as uh, independent contractors um, in some capacity. And of course, the whole independent contractor employee situation is completely separate. We've been through that uh, already um, this past summer. Um, so I don't want to get into that into that into the weeds on that right now but point is that the jpa provides a flexibility as to how uh how we engage um but in any event um there are three options that we've laid out for you one option is to uh, have an agreement that provides for the creation of a fee and the, that um that fee uh, i don't know jackie is that is that version of the agreement in front of the board? Tonight? No, no, it isn't. Okay. It's the one that we uh, there was a there was a version, and there was some question as to whether or not you know folks would go for it because it would require a mandatory fee of all members, and the the fee was basically for uh, cities with a population up to thirty thousand seventy five hundred per mm -hmm. uh, year, thirty thousand to seventy five thousand in population, it'd be fifteen thousand per year, and then. Um, in excess of 75,000, it was to be um, 35,000 per year. That was the fee. So then there was some concern that, you know, cities might not approve it or might not want to join yep. if there was a, a fee. And, <laughs> nope. and so there was some thought that we should approve it without a fee right. and allow <laughs> the, the board of directors to consider a fee at some later time. So, we had a version that has no fee. Um, it simply gives the board the uh, discretion to approve a fee later. Um, and then the third version has a chart that basically doesn't have a fee, but provides guidance to the board, uh, the future board, as to uh, if they do adopt a fee, that it has to be uh, proportionate to population. So I don't know if, is that chart in front of the um, board, Jackie? No, I don't think so either. Well, there, so, there's a language. There's some language in here with it um, basically states uh, in C at the end of C1 that there's a chart, but there is no table uh, provided uh, that um, it shall be roughly proportional to each party in the amounts reflected in the table above. But but it wasn't uh, it right, wasn't well, clear. I created, a, I created a table. And, and I'm sorry it's not in front of you. Basically, the table says cities with a population up to 30,000 would be the base fee, whatever the base fee is. Um, 30 to 75,000 would be the base fee multiplied by two. And uh, in excess of 75,000 population would be base fee times four. So it's a very simple formula. Um, uh -uh. So, right. Thanks, Torrance. And then the county. <laughs> Michael, question. We have a question, Michael. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Wasn't there a discussion at the housing forum or what we just had before this meeting? Yeah. Of some measure H addendum or add on that could potentially continuously fund? Is that my imagination or is that? If, if measure M passes, the, the, I mean, not measure M, it's measure H. 
And if measure if the ballot measure patch passes, it would include funding for the regional trust. And the regional trust says that the South Bay and the West Side split 7% of the proceeds, but we would have to split it with the West Side. And I don't exactly know right now what 7% would be. If we didn't form the trust, what would happen with our portion? I think it could come to the COG or it could come to the Okay. If you don't have a trust, you can't use the money designated for a trust. Right. I don't think that money is designated for trust. I think it's designated for this sector. For the spare, uh, spare, we yeah. could look. We can look more closely at that. But I mean, I, I think the the issue here is simply if you if the cities were to create a trust that has no funding mechanism, what is the benefit of that? It wouldn't be able to do anything, but it would exist as a legal entity and would therefore be eligible for funding. And if it received funding, then it would be able to start operating. If you don't have a legal entity in place, then you're not in a position to solicit, apply for, et cetera, funding designated for housing trusts. So the, the argument would go, you're behind the eight ball because you're not in a position to get the funding if you don't have the housing trust in existence to begin with. So that's the, that's the advantage. Uh, the disadvantage is if you set it up without any funding mechan internal funding mechanism, then you really can't do anything. It's just going to sit there moribund until and unless we get an infusion of cash. Based, based on the, the I guess, fee schedule that you'd come up with, how much money would the trust generate annually uh, and be able to operate with? Jackie, that number was what, 300? 250, uh, 300? The administrative cost is about 300,000. You have to hire somebody and you have to get a consultant to do the. Uh, and how much is that? How much would also be generated by this 7,500, 15,000, $35,000 fee? That's what I think that's what we base the, fee, the schedule on, right? Okay. Yes. The, the managers. We had to raise 300,000. Yeah. Yeah. David, yeah. To the chair, uh, yes, yeah. Jackie. I wanted to follow up uh, the question that was just asked, and asked to what extent has there been a projection as to what amount would be a minimal amount, depending upon how many cities join, for this to be a viable entity to be able to do some good beyond just establishing the structure. I don't want it to be circular. Obviously, we need the structure first. We just were told, but I'm wondering what amount, based on conversations with some of these other. Uh, jurisdictions that have established a happiness truck is a viable amount so that this is frankly worth all of our time and effort. I don't know how to answer that. I think that some of the, tr I think the trust, they said gateway starting with 8 million or something like that, or am I getting that wrong? What the, the issue that we have is we have not gone to the development community or to the cities to find out what would be in the pipeline. And that's what the, our the SCAG project is going to be doing in the coming. So the one thing we probably know, I guess, is that it's going to cost about $300,000 to for administrative costs to hire somebody who can run the trust and also oversee loan agreements and all the thing, all the financial agreements that are going to be coming in. We're going to need somebody and, and a staff to do that. So that's the only that's the only cost I know I can give you right now. I think you're going to need uh, you're going to definitely need seed funding. But it's going to probably be based your the amount that you will need is going to be based on an analysis of what the potential is, and we don't have that. I'm coming in late, but I'm just wondering to what extent there has been this sort of analysis, let alone an assessment of potential grant funds, because I think you're hearing a Bronx cheer with regard to the eagerness of some of the electeds in this room to come up with funds and convince their colleagues to commit funds at this time. And I recognize it's premature, but I just was wondering if there's a projection about how this progresses. Yeah. And if you're looking for um, an order of magnitude, is that what you're looking for? Sure. I mean, we're talking millions of dollars. I mean, do you want more than that? You, this, this trust can't leverage housing projects in a meaningful way without millions of dollars to, to, to do it. Now, these costs that Jackie's talking about, they, we're, these are just administrative expenses, um, uh, uh, compensation to experts, staffing, whatever, to get, to put everything in place, to put loan agreements in place, to 
come up with some creative strategies for how to finance, what kinds of finance, what kinds of projects should be financed, what's out there, who, what developers are out there who've got um, uh, projects entitled or near entitlement, who are shovel ready. Um, that research has to be done um, because the other, the other housing trusts, their philosophy is that they take the project applications in the order of those that are most ready to actually proceed with construction, shovel ready projects. So that's the order they take them. And so, but we, we haven't done any research in, in, in our territorial area to ascertain what's out there, what developers would be coming in and applying for financing. Um, have they already acquired their properties? Um, have they already gotten some entitlements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that, that work would still have to be done and we couldn't do it until we had a source of financing to do that. And that would cost several hundred thousand dollars. But once we were at that point, David, I think your question is, um, is there any value in this if there's no money to be had? And the answer is obviously no. But I think everyone is proceeding with this on the presumption that we have, uh, the state has declared a housing crisis, that there is a need for housing, that there is going to be financial support from the state, from the county um, for housing projects, and that, and that that is a safe assumption to rely on. And I don't know how comfortable you are with that. I'm not an expert in this area. Um, I, I'm not in a position to give you the kind of information about this that others would be. Um, but the housing trusts that we heard from today are doing this work and they have millions and millions of dollars available to them. They are doing revolving loans. They are doing all kinds of incentive uh, um, financing. Um, the uh, San Gabriel Valley has an $8 million uh, revolving fund that they use and they give two to five year loans, loans for uh, acquisition and pre-development only. As soon as the property has been acquired and all of the pre-development costs have been incurred, the developer gets permanent construction financing elsewhere and then repays that loan back into the revolving fund so that that money can then be re-loaned to another developer. And, and, that's, and, th and that is a successful program that they are operating with, it, with an $8 million corpus. Okay, We would need to have a corpus of funds to be able to do that. Are, are we likely to get that corpus? I don't know. I'm not in a position to judge, but everyone is, I think, in operating under the assumption that we will, that there will be money available for constructing housing. Helpful. Does that help have, you with that question? I have. That's helpful. I have just one quick mechanical question for you, Michael, and that has to do with Section 2, the minimum number of participating parties required to set up the JPA. You mentioned two, which is consistent with California law. I think this provision refers to four. It four, I thought. I, th I did think it says, it says four. It says four. We can change it to two, but I think we needed, we want- I'm referring to section 2A under term. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I passed over that. Two is, two, as you point out, two is the minimum required by law. The city manager said it should be at least four. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back well, that, to, the, that was, to the. Uh, can we go back a little bit back to the fees? Because I think you go if if you put fees on this GPA agreement, you're going to have a lot of cities that probably is not going to pass. Okay, because when you think about it, I, I don't want to talk to, with my colleagues over here, but a lot of these cities are not going to build affordable housing. <laughs> they, they don't have no land. First of all. And then when you start looking at the cities potentially could build affordable housing, it would be maybe Hawthorne, Gardena, Carson, right? Maybe non-incorporated areas. So you're going to be limited when you start thinking about $15,000 to $30,000, potentially $90,000 for a city that's over 80,000 people, it's going to think twice, especially those who have housing department into the cities, right? Because then we can get the money from the state, from the federal government also to build, to build housing with, with partnerships. So think about it because what I'm looking at this, 
uh, if you're going to say we're going to have to have $300,000 to store the GPA, that is going to give us a pause. Okay, uh, let me just stop a second. And I know Wally has his hand up, but I, I just want to say that we started, we, we missed an opportunity. Reef one, which was two years ago or whatever, is when the Gateway Cog went and got a consultant to do an entire analysis of what a trust would mean. And we missed that. We didn't, we used our REAP one for something else. So we have REAP two that we're going to be doing that. That's you are asking a lot of questions that what we heard, I think, at four o'clock shows that there is promise. But we can't tell you there is promise because we don't have the study that's been done. So um, I think the city managers wanted very much. They've been working on this for a year. They wanted to bring this to you tonight. But I think it, it it's clear that, you know, in my opinion, you're going to need more information. Yeah. We're going to get you more information. And um, and this is going to have to come to the COG board and to each city council. And um, and then you'll see, I mean, it looked like there were benefits, but I can, we can't tell you that those benefits will transfer here until the analysis has been done. Um, I don't know if you want to call him. Wally. Wally. Yeah, hi, good evening, everybody. And uh, Mike, I have a question. Why well, maybe Jackie too? <clears throat> Part of that information is uh, I get that we're all impressed with San Gabriel Valley and so forth, but how do they define success? And is anybody really evaluating it? In other words, a volume of housing is is a volume of housing, but uh, really a key issue is how much of it is rental housing versus how much it is for ownership, because there's a giant debate that goes on in the housing policy arena about not creating a whole generation of people who are tenants without a chance to to own anything. But another question is how affordable is affordable? And another question is um, what size, who, how diverse? In other words, are we talking about one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom? We're we talking about all apartments, multifamily, no single family. There are qualities to this that I think need to be defined in terms of what success means to them other than we got all these housing, all these houses built. So is that is is that supposed to be part of what we're going to hire a consultant to do? For David to say, yeah. shaking yes. and said yes that we will get that information. The speakers at the workshop earlier were really highlighting the point that you can develop programs in your trust that reflect your region, and so it doesn't uh, exempt ownership programs. It could be rental. It could be converting uh, a dilapidated. Um, apartment building, uh, funding the renovation if the owner was going to approve a certain number of those units to be um, affordable. So you don't have to even build totally brand new buildings. So there's a lot of flexibility in this program that I think the REAP 2 grant will help us flush out for the South Bay. Right. So when we get that grant, we'll know more. Let's also question. remember the REAP 2 grant is very specifically about greenhouse gas emissions reduction, very specifically. Well, wait, okay, but we got approval to do this in the REAP 2 grant, so we're going to do it. Okay, thank you. Got two hands down here, Cedric. We got a, oh. He got a question. Actually, we already got answered. Oh, <laughs> who, else had a, who else had a question? Yes, no, not a question, just a comment. Um, I don't want to go too deeply into the merits of the regional housing trust, but my understanding was that this was a discussion and an idea that started because folks had expressed frustration that we were getting legislation from Sacramento, basically telling us where housing needed to go. And this was an opportunity to take some ownership of it on a regional basis and try to figure out if we can create essentially a marketplace where we can work together to put it where it makes the most sense regionally. Moving to the issues of funding, I'm not crystal clear on where the seed money, the initial money would come from. I think it probably might come from several pots of money. All I can do is share with you for the ongoing funding that it requires. In Hermosa Beach right now, we're, we have a housing element which has yet to be certified by HCD. We're right now talking about land value recapture, which you're probably familiar with, lots of you. Um, but in the conceptual discussions we've had, that would be a source of funding for us, for example, that we would use to contribute to a regional housing trust so that we could be a part of the decision making about where we build housing on a regional basis. So I wanted to bring up the that. point that there might be other money that's not your general fund money that you would give to the housing trust to seed it and right. then whatever. Yeah, the housing trust does give you the opportunity to have state fund. So just so that the, 
qualify. And for for at least for the for SD two, I think this is important because we need more for the supervisors that mm -hmm. need housing. Uh, and then seeing how affordable housing projects have been processed, at least internally through the county, they looked for ver various uh, funding sources, and then this would provide another one, uh, more funding source, even for the smaller ones. And if we could think outside, like what the other COGS are doing on ADUs, a lot of these small, small mom and pops that are struggling, they want to build their IDUs either to make extra money or just improve their 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 land, their their property. This would be helpful if we think outside the box with the, with what that's going on. So it's at least from the SC two perspective, it is it this would be great, and then and it's something that we will we will, at least uh, the team has strength as they're supportive of it. Mike, I have two questions. One. If we approve this without a funding source, it'll just be a document in name only? You would have a legally established legal entity. It would be a joint powers authority and it would, it would, it would uh, exist. Um, so it would be more than a document because you would actually have an organization um, and, and, and each of the cities, each of the member cities would elect a, a representative to that organization on the board. But, but because you wouldn't have any money, you couldn't really do anything. You could have meetings, you could have conversations, you could talk about applying for grants, you could talk about uh, priorities, you could have discussions, but unless the COG staff could, uh, or, or the staff of one of the member cities, um, uh, would be one of the member cities would be willing to make their staff available to to do some work. You wouldn't really have any money to do anything, but it would be more than just a piece of paper. It would definitely be an existing legal entity. So then, my next question: If we do nothing tonight, are we looking at timelines that may not be met, or can this be put off until it's not on for action no yeah. okay. it's not on for action. okay discussion. this discussion okay just, just making sure so if, if, if it goes nowhere go ahead just have a proposal for how we can move this forward although i see others have questions and that is jackie might it be constructive to raise some questions here for staff to look into and then report back so that we're not stopping this from moving forward but we're asking some of these questions which you've heard reflected here well i have we had tonight for the housing forum, we had 17 questions that I had sent to the people that were on the forum. They answered substantially. I mean, you I already asked at the August meeting and at several meetings for city managers, the board, and the community development directors to give me questions. Those questions went to the speakers that talked at the forum tonight or today, whatever it was. And so um, we've done that. If you have more questions, obviously send them to me, but we've done the question thing. So I don't know what to tell you. I can think of a number of questions I might have as an elected yeah. official, but I don't want to take yeah. time. Yeah, well, maybe, it, yeah, Rodney is saying we have it, we taped it so that you could hear yeah. what we said because it was a very good form. Right. Okay. That recording's going up? Yeah, it, yeah. when will it go up? Uh, probably <laughs> tomorrow. Okay. I'm going to do it tonight, but it's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> In the next couple of days. Okay, okay. Get here, get here. Yeah, I have some questions regarding the agreement itself, which is not clear what the basis of the provision, why it exists in the document. So instead of asking, approving, no, I understand, yeah. but, but I'm just saying send them to me. I mean, yeah. I'd be glad to send them to me and then I'll talk to Mike about it. Okay. Okay, Debbie. Right. My questions are along the lines of what you were asking, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, where, where does this agreement fit or not fit? We're going to have a consultant from SCAG who's going to help us put the meat on the bones, as you say. From us, but it's uh, We're going to get a REIT uh, 2 grant to do some more looking into things. Where assessments, does, yeah. assessments. We're not getting it, right? Those are it's assessments. assessments. It's the same thing. Like the okay. same thing. Okay, so where does this agreement fit in that? We don't need to have this agreement signed before we do all that, right? We don't need to have Well, the city agreement. managers wanted to present it to you. And um, if you all felt it was a good idea, then they then we would put it on here for action. Then we would take. Then they would go to their city councils and your city managers would talk to you about it. Uh, it doesn't look like it's ready for that yet. I will go back to the city managers. I will, and Mike is here and Sue just here, and we will talk to them about this and what the next steps would be. But whatever steps happens to this agreement, we're still going to proceed with it. Wow. So we don't need this agreement. 
Not right now. Give me the background. Give me the background. But my, my next steps would be at this point, all of us who have questions and concerns, send them to Jackie so that they can be flushed out and, and given back to you. The second part would be with the reef and the funding that's possibly coming in based upon the grant to do the other analysis of the other questions that's been stated today to get that done in place. And then at that point, we can bring back what it might be as far as a cost per city, if that's the case, if you want to do the startup process. But I know many of us do not have any additional funds in our budgets to try and pay for something else. But we just need to learn what is viable enough to make this happen. And if it can, it can. If it can, it can't. But I'm just saying that information should be given to you. So then you come back, Mike, with all this information, we have we are more informed on our decision making. Um, is there potentially a missing step? Like, I feel like there should be some sort of business plan. Like, it almost seems like that's what we're creating. That's, that's what, what that's, that's what that's okay, good. That's what the we plan. Yeah. So, in other words, what are we actually going right. to do? Right. And right. so, how much money do we need to right. that's it. do that? Okay. That's exactly good. What we're good. Okay. Right. Right. Exactly. You might not even business. know what we don't know. We need, we need the experts. We need a business plan. Yeah. We need experts to do Mr. That. Chair, real. Yes. <laughs> um, to your point, your question about if we sign this agreement without any funding, is it just a paper exercise and I'm going to put Jeff on the spot because he mentioned to me a moment ago that once you have the agreement in place, you are eligible for funding potentially from the state and federal government. So you have a vehicle from which you, to which you can direct funding. Yeah. But my concern is if you had that document and that was the case, who is going to administer it? Jackie doesn't have any money in her coffers to do the administration piece. That's why, or the expertise, <laughs> that's why they needed to have that other seed money. So it's like you're putting the cart before the horse. You can't do one before, you know, so you don't want to sit there with the document or an agreement and someone want to hand you $8 million. What do you do? <laughs> Give it back because you don't have any way to, to deal with it. Well, you could carve out of the eight million yeah. the administration that's part of the no, that's what i don't understand why there isn't any that's if that's part of the agreement of the eight million yes. that eight million may say you can't do that administrative cost from i mean i'm just saying that is one option yeah. but sure. no, yeah. it's not the impediment or maybe people can come up with some once they got the eight million but you know so that might be different that's why i don't even want to go that let's let's get this part done then let's come back sure. let's not create a problem when you don't need one well, come on, we always do this. I know, I know, I can't. What are you, Barry? <laughs> Mike, have anything else you want to add? No, sir. Okay. Thank you, Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. You're Mike. welcome. City clowns feel better. Feel better. Yeah. Thank you. Have some rest. Hydrate. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see. I said hydrate. <laughs> <laughs> Go running. Go running some more. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the the gift that you're going to be getting tonight. Is that Wally spent the day traveling and is not going to be giving his oh. so? But you can find our final reports. He will give it another night. Ouch! <laughs> but um, uh, uh, that's so a compliment. The final reports are on our our website under uh, get to time. So get to time. He left already. Yeah. So um, the final reports are there. There's the link. Take a look. They're very very good. But we will also do a summary at a future meeting. Okay. Homeless services. Homeless is um, Ronson. You're up. Okay, um, so we want to talk about the um, the executive level committee meeting, right? That was yeah. coming up, and so I think I've reached out to a lot of your mayors uh, about two weeks ago because we were going to have a meeting to elect uh, uh, someone to represent us in this new executive level action team. Um, let me share. Let me say that the, the, while you're doing this, the, the this is the city selection committee meeting that's coming up. It's going to, uh, um, it, we share this seat with West Side Cities, and it's for the blue the ribbon. Executive level uh, committee. Blue ribbon? Yeah, I think it's a blue ribbon. ribbon. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's not like a formal name for it yet, I don't think. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of refresh your memory. I won't read every bullet, uh, but basically one of the, the supervisor approved one of the recommend, uh, the seven recommendations, one of which is this executive level action team uh, that's supposed to um, develop a countywide plan to address homelessness, establish performance indicators, and basically be kind of the, the accountability body that's sorely lacking in homeless services. The, the team would compose of two members from the Board of Supervisors, the Mayor of the City of Los Angeles, the President of the Los Angeles City Council, and this is the key, the four city members, the North County, San Fernando Valley, Southwest Corridor, and San Gabriel Valley. 
uh, and um, the southeast part of, uh, of the county, and uh, a representative from the, 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 the California governor. Um, why is this important? And again, I won't read the bullets, but I mean, I think one of the biggest things is cities are not represented uh, in any of the current bodies right now. And, and that's that's a very big oversight. Um, it's, cities aren't represented in lots of commissions, COC boards, CCS policy council. So for, for the very first time, we will have city representation uh, in the homelessness crisis. But we do have uh, somebody with John Marish on the LaCosta. LaCosta, which, which was newly formed for the housing trust of the county. Um, and so uh, what we will, so uh, council member Paige Kaladurovic from Redonda Beach has thrown her hat in the ring. Uh, I believe another person that's running is- The other person is Santa Monica yeah. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Mayor. Liam Davis? Yes, she's thrown her hat in the ring. And so- um, So yeah, so, you know, obviously, you know, we, we would like to support uh, our council member uh, from Donna Beach. The reason why is uh, uh, she is the, she was, uh, the, the culture of Birch was from the same district as, as she was. Uh, from 2020 to 2022, Donna Beach has reduced its homelessness by over 40%. Um, they were the first ones to pilot the outdoor uh, homeless court. Um, first, re first city in our region to do the pallet shelter. Uh, they're a city that has its own housing authority and uh, they're currently setting up a new project home key site and they're working on a turn of crisis response program. So they, they've been in it uh, and, and uh, you know, we believe that they can be uh, someone that can lead us in this new body okay. and, and provide our point of view, uh, have a sounding board for some of our, our needs and wants. And so this is a great opportunity for us to, to get someone uh, and have a voice in the county. Let me, let me just mention that the city selection committee, as you know, is mayors, but mayors can vote with somebody else now. And there was a meeting that was set up by the county. The county does a terrible job. They told me they give two weeks. They can, they have to give two weeks notice. That's it. But they made a 9 a.m. meeting in downtown L.A. Mm -hmm. So um, I contacted them and asked when their next meeting would be. And I said, you know, we would be glad to host it here. And uh, and so we the next meeting will be nine uh, at 11 a.m. November 9th here. And um, that makes it a lot easier for you to come out for Paige um, because close to the South Bay cities. Um, I'm not sure the city selection will be- November. November 9th. I'm not sure the city selection committee has sent the notice yet, but they have to two weeks before November 9th. And so please tell your mayor, your votes are based on the size of your city. So we need every city, but we also need to make sure there are votes there. Um, uh, just to be perfectly honest, it's my understanding that before Paige got her hat in the ring, um, a supervisor, a super, Mayor Butts from Inglewood uh, supported the Santa Monica person because that's who we knew. That's a huge city with a lot of votes. So we need a lot of you to come out there for Paige. Um, and so please, you know, please do that. Um, How does so I just wanted to say that I agree with the suggestion as far as the Dogda Beach um, delegate, I think would be a good one. Also, I, I do know the mayor of Santa Monica, and if we don't have our, our representative for Redondo Beach, I think Santa Monica will be fine then, too. So it's not like we're looking at an A versus an F. It's like it's A or A minus. Nine, yeah. Nine uh, 11. Maybe a B plus. <laughs> I'd just rather for it to be someone here. Yeah. Do we still have to bring the proxy from the mayor? Yes. Okay. You come and sure. bring a proxy. I think, don't you need to bring a proxy in the mayor? I don't know because they, the city selection we change is that role. not transparent. You might be right. But, but, no, but you should have a delegate and then there should be an alternate that's already been pre selected at your council meeting. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. That should already be done. So the reason why I know that because my mayor is the mayor, but I'm the alternate. Yeah. There's all, the mayor's all of the, de the mayors are the delegates. Yeah, my recollection, because we did change that when it was still being held with the Cal Cities meetings, was that uh, the mayor is the automatic delegate, and then should the mayor not be in attendance, any other council member uh, in attendance becomes yeah. the voting delegate. But I thought they had to. I thought they had to RSVP. I thought they had to uh, put their name in. So please I, check I, it out. We well. don't know um, the the guy from the city's election committee. I have said for years, you don't copy the cogs mm. no. so we can't help our cities get there and so this time he said you know i think maybe we'll start copying the cogs so he i still don't have the notice so i don't know if i'm getting copied or not but 
it'll be here. So please, I, please come. I do know, like Mayor Grant just sent an email to the committee saying I'm going to I'm going to delegate this person to represent me. So yeah, I think you have to. Email. I thought you had. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on to some. So please check with your mayor. Please make sure nine, yeah. November 9th here, you at eleven o'clock. Okay. Uh, and I just want just a couple of quick things. Uh, just some feel good stories. Uh, last month. You all voted to approve uh, a, a SRO, single room occupancy and motel leasing program from the COG. And we've already housed two people in this program from, from the pier. Uh, so that's been great. And then uh, lastly, um, you know, we hired Kathy Hetzer. Uh, it's kind of a new new program, but like we, she's going to sponsor for our client aid project. And uh, someone called her the senior whisperer because she has a very good uh, grasp of senior issues. Mm, um, and so and this is an example of this 80-year-old lady, uh, homeless, sleeps in her car, uh, was going to a housing appointment. Uh, the case manager noticed her car was making this really loud, nasty sound. And it turned out she needed new brakes and rotors. Uh -huh. uh, and so the con oh, put, put up 400 bucks, really cheap, to repair brakes and rotors. Uh, what was great about the story is the mechanic uh, uh, because she was sleeping in the car, the mechanic stayed late, waited for the parts to come, and Aww. worked on the car until 8.30 at night, and then left, and so that she had a car to sleep in. Uh, so it just shows you that it takes a team, it takes a community, uh, so it's, it's a great story. Okay. And then the other thing, there's two other things I wanted to make sure you know. First is, um, we are sending a letter, Cedric signed a letter to Steve Bradford that I'm going to send out to your cities. In 2021, Steve Bradford signed legislation that um, uh, said that renters' payments had to be reported. And the reason for that is that renters do not have a credit rating. And so there's no way that landlords will not let rented people because they don't have any credit rating. When you buy a home, your mortgage gets reported, your mortgage payments get reported, and you have a credit rating. So Bradford's legislation said that they had to start reporting the renter's income. And what's happened is there was an analysis done, and you're going to get this letter, that 3,000 Californians have established new credit reports. Um, they got an average score, which was pretty high. There was over $534 million in capital access created. Over $313 million in mortgage loans were received. Auto loans, mortgage loans, student loans were accessed. I mean, it, just tremendous numbers because of this one piece of legislation. So we wanted to honor and thank Steve Bradford and we're gonna um, send this to cities for maybe you, you might wanna do the same. And then the last thing that I wanted to put in here and, and um, is, the, is the whole issue of the ballot measure. And what's happening now is that there's, um, and this just came to light yesterday for me, that um, as you know, measure H is, is expiring, um, I guess in 2027, but they, they're gonna put it on the ballot in November. But there's been a committee to try to decide what goes on the ballot in November. And the idea would be that what's going, been going on is I think the supervisors, I'm going to just give my interpretation, then Jeff is here and B is here to talk more. But the supervisors sort of gave this job to the United Way to come up with, you know, what, what should the ballot measure look like? The United, um, United Way, I was told, sort of did this in uh, with some group, but not including cities or not in, uh, listening to cities and their ballot measure is really pretty onerous. And it includes not just measure H, but it includes, they've had to include money for this regional housing trust. So it's a two, it's once for the trust, money is gonna be in this for the trust. It's also gonna extend measure H. So United Way's measure, which I do not have the details of, but I have been told that it is really bad for cities. It got Lindsay Horvath and I think Catherine Barger so angry that they're writing their own measure and their measure is not good. They're working with um, with uh, Mayor, Mayor Bass and LA is going to get a disproportionate amount of money and no one's coming to cities. So we just heard this yesterday and we really, I mean, I called Jeff, I called John Marsh uh, because I felt that we elected him to represent, you elected him, I didn't elect him, to represent um, us on this board. And the board has not even heard the issue. It's not even come to them. So this is all happening. And, and Jeff tells me it has to be filed next week to get on the ballot. Like Monday, they're yeah, planning. That's the plan. So that's, Jeff, you want to go on and, and what have I missed? Uh, no, I, that, that everything you said is, is, is correct. What um, the information that we've gleaned is that uh, under this Horvath Bass proposal, the city of LA would receive 60% of all of the local return money. 
Uh, local return would be pegged at 15%. City of LA would receive 60% of that. Um, that's what we're hearing. That leaves, uh, you know, 87 other cities in the county to, um, get, you know, to have the rest of the 40, the 40 percent. Uh, and that, that just doesn't seem to to make sense, uh, at least. And, and I should say the United Way one, what I heard about it was it actually has very punitive measures to cities. It says, like, if you don't uh, house this number of people, you might lose your money kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it's very punitive. There are some that things. I have the, the, okay, so the, have the text of what it was put out to us just this morning, but it's subject to change. Um, so I, I just want to, the call of the, the request for all of you is to put in an urgent request to Supervisor Hahn or, or whoever your supervisor is to urge them uh, to please support a meaningful, flexible rate of return from the monies we, our cities have given in Measure 8 funds to come back to the cities for use for homelessness services. So that's the, the problem, because as Jeff mentioned, there is a disproportionate amount, um, and it was not in the original version of the United Way proposal, but it came later um, that 60% would go to the city of LA. But it's <clears throat> the measure as it's drafted now, which I said could change, basically says 60% um, of, uh, of the fees collected go to comprehensive homelessness services, but there's no funding per se for that. Um, the local solutions fund, which is deemed the local return, and then homelessness solutions innovations. Well, the, the last one is just 1.65 of, of that um, 60%. The, the amount for cities is, is at least 15%. So that's leaving 43.35% unaccounted for. That where is it going? Um, so that's that's a problem. The other thing is that in they when they do the 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 carve out for the local solutions fund, not only does city sixty percent go to the city of L.A., but the forty percent to other cities is determined based on a formula that the board of supervisors will draft up. Um, that will be based on a point in time count or some other similar measure and in consultation with the cities. So it does, it's really unclear how much money, okay, there should be a formula spelled out, not just left up in the air. And um, something really important that leads out is when, when you do it based on a point uh, in time, uh, you get where the homeless are. You don't get where the homeless are from. And like, if we look at Skid Row, there's hardly anyone who was born in Skid Row. So these people all came from somewhere else. And if we don't address the problem on a regional basis with all of our communities, then there's no way we're going to have a long-term impact. Okay. So the other thing that's a little bit, that is very problematic is all the things that Ronson mentioned about how we're getting representation on this executive committee, uh, which is supposed to uh, develop a strategic plan for the county for homelessness services. This document takes away some of that, those powers uh, for the executive committee. So they specifically state that if the target metrics uh, haven't been achieved, you know, by December 31st, 2030, <laughs> then the board, of, this executive committee would make recommendations, but they can only recommend internal reallocations between 2.5% and 5% of the total allocation to the county or to the housing agency. So they limit them there. And in this document, um, they Instead of, if say one city, this is the punitive thing you mentioned, Jackie. If let's say a city um, is has unexpended funds of 30% or more of its proceeds from its share uh, in two consecutive reports, then that excess doesn't go back to the cities, to other cities to use. It goes to La Casa. And so it gets lost. And so, I mean, what little bit we have gets gets taken away. Um, the bottom line is that if this could be the best measure in the world. This is not the way to involve us in the measure. It's crazy. 
Yeah. So, and and then the, the one of the final you know issues on the executive committee, which is the final time we actually cities have a voice, it basically says that this executive committee uh, can be amended from time to time by the board of supervisors um, or a, a, some successor body, and if the executive committee is dissolved, um, then the board of supervisors uh, can. Uh, shall establish another oversight body, but only after receiving recommendations from the mayors of LA and the mayors of Long Beach, nobody else. Uh -huh. that, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just saying. Diane, you got a question? Yeah, a comment. Um, so I don't see everybody taking great notes on what V is speedily saying. So uh, I see this is agendized as action items. So could we just uh, yes. direct the purpose? Well, it's under homeless services, right? Yeah, but that's not agenda. This is an action. Oh, of course. This is SPCOG program action items, reports, and updates. So this is an update. Well, it's, it, this is an update. Yeah, because I didn't know about it. I mean, I, okay. I didn't even know about it. So it's like going on a fast track. Yeah, I mean, if you want to add it to the agenda, you have to vote to add it to the agenda uh, to, for an action item. For, for, an, uh, for today's agenda. You can do it. You can do it now. Yes, you can do it now. Okay. Can you make so a motion? motion to add it for as an action item to the agenda. It's time critical. I think you can do it. I need a second. So second. second. Okay, second from Alex. It's been property moved and second, David. Any opposition? Any abstentions? Abstention. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, it's been added. Now, what's the wish? Action item would be to have a letter prepared, I, I, hopefully by the COG, or B, if you got a skeleton that you want to send over to Jackie and the COG, send one on our collective behalf. Uh, representing, I would also, we, I believe you have the letter. I haven't seen it yet, but we, we are sending a letter as, as the division, but I would definitely urge not just to, to, to hold on to it yes. as a letter. You really do have to call your supervisors. Right. But um, in addition, and, have a letter. talk to them sure. about this because this could potentially be filed next week. Monday. Monday. So Monday. So we have only two. That's tomorrow. Okay, so the weekend. A letter is good. It you know puts us on the right. I, I think we need it. We need a letter that tells us what to say to the yeah, supervisor yeah, when right. it calls. Yeah. It, it, it engage with the city. Yeah. Don't let the city of LA take the lion's share of yeah. funding without any. Problem. Yeah, the fact that this is coming up so fast that, that yeah, there's no. Way. Way. I mean, that to me, you don't need all the substance. You need the fact that you you've left this on the table, and if we if we're not going to support this, it's not going to pass. Yeah, even an email saying, "Hey guys, right. here's what to call you." So if you send me something tomorrow, okay. I will send it out, and then you can make your calls and also Thanks. send an email yourselves. Yeah, yes. for sure. I, I, mean, I, I did email because we were searching original Han. Not telling you not to call Han's office, but I thought we I think we have Han's office covered a little bit we were trying to reach uh senator excuse me um Mitchell. mitchell's office mm -hmm. uh the other, the other day i'm thinking stella supervisor mitchell's okay. office so. well yes. quite frankly this would probably need to be supervisor to supervisor but i understand the the staff component is important as well <laughs> g-r-a-c-i-a-n and and so I think the essence, because, you know, you don't have to get into the nitty gritty details for this, simply say, you know, cities collect monies for uh, for measure H and 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 the increase would be not the 25 percent sales tax. It would be 50 percent under this uh, because of uh, AB 1679 Santiago. Isn't it gives them the option, but that's so all they're but talking they, about. But they're using the fifty percent. Yeah. It gives up to fifty percent, but they're going for fifty. You know, for the because it's five. Both yeah. Measure H and the La Costa. Right. And the so, but but the uh, but the cities need to have input in this. It cannot be drafted alone <laughs> and and it, uh, to the disadvantage of cities. And cities need a significant return of their investment that their constituents are making in terms of taxes that are going towards homelessness services because we have cities that are spending millions of dollars and they're not and they're getting just peanuts from their measure million Florence contributes 15 million i think you should also i mean people pay attention to elections and i think you should also saber rattle a little bit to say that you are doing a lot of work without talking to us and if we oppose this measure yeah. then it's all for naught Right. We all want this to pass. We all want money for homelessness. We all want to help. Not problem. that way. But we yeah. but we will have no choice to, to come out against what you're what you're yeah. saying. And I think I would say that because they understand. I mean, 
Yes. Yeah, politics. That's that's basically. really our only leverage, isn't it? I mean, yes. because they yes. don't need us to get it on the ballot. Right. They mm -hmm. need us to pass it. Pass it. That's right. And the letter's right. point would be, hey, if you want a chance to get our support once this if this makes the ballot, we need to be involved. Yeah. And we can't can support it. That's the issue. I can send it to right. you. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and so I, I can send an electronic copy of this, but I think the um, important thing also know that, I mean, not an, is the league board also made a, a decision that we want to oppose the current version and, 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 and ask for input on this. But then also I talked to contract city's president and he said, Oh no, you know, you need to tell them that we're going to oppose this. Yeah. That's and, and so, so we have a lot of uh, entities that are, are on the bandwagon to say no. Uh, this is not going to fly. This current version. <laughs> motion is so direct. Staff to give us some talking points. Second. Second. Yeah. How can we vote it? Oh. But can't we can't uh, to give us talking points to oppose? I think you have to say an action. Oh, sure. So to oppose the current uh, current current uh, drafts of this this uh, measure. That's all. I'll second to, to include the city. Can you Dave, letter to who did the second? I can do the letter. Okay. They oppose. Okay. I think it's I think it's Barry. 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 Yeah. Okay. Any Dave, opposition? Anybody want to say? I'll say Barry. It's Any of the group? Barry. Same one. Uh -huh. Same guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Transportation. A transportation reports. Um, I I sent Mike Bulky home from the screen because Stephanie really covered transportation. Okay. So we're done with that. Um, local travel network. Local travel network. I hope that you're all going to join us on November second. Um, we're going to have at three o'clock at the El Segundo City Hall. We're having the ribbon cutting for the local travel network. Turtle signs are up in El Segundo, and we are going to have an incredible treat, which is Barry and his. I don't know the name of your group. South Bay Coast. going to be a turtle. Coastliners. You wear a turtle suit. He wants you to wear a turtle suit. <laughs> <laughs> um, you could uh, be performing. Point. They're going to be performing. In the turtle costume. It's going to be performing. And I can't um, work in these conditions. I'll be in my trailer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and, and the El Segundo City Council members have neighborhood electric vehicles, and they're going to take people for rides. If you come, you can get a ride on a neighborhood electric vehicle. There's a farmer's market there. You can buy your vegetables. So please, three o'clock this coming Thursday. We're very excited about it. And um, City of El Segundo has been great in, in helping us out. David, do you want to answer, add anything to that? Okay. okay. Be Kim. Yeah, and I only have one thing that I want to let you guys know. We've been working with the LA County for um, energy efficiency funding. So we're going to have a lot of work ahead of us. We are looking at eight years of funding mm -hmm. in levels of a minimum of three hundred thousand per year, which is how much we're getting now. So how much are we getting now? We're only getting two fifteen, and it um, increases every year. So we're looking at two point eight, over two point eight million over the eight years, or it can go up as high as three point seven million over the next eight years, so that we can do energy efficiency projects for all of the South Bay cities. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited about that. The other thing is this doesn't include any of the grant proposals that we've been on. We were several like direct installs for community, um, uh, residential community um, programs and um, resiliency center funding. And we have the opportunity to do pilot programs. So we're working with the cities to identify what they'd like to do in their cities. And we're gonna propose those on top of that. So it's really exciting. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of energy efficiency work in the South Bay. Okay, and then Kim, why don't you go on to the clear? We have a clarification at the. Oh, do you want to talk? I just had a quick question for Kim. Sure. Um, I think I may have raised this before, so I apologize. But we've been doing years of retiring incandescent bulbs and replacing them with LEDs and and doing energy efficiency. Does the Energy Commission or state agency or anybody track whether we've managed to sort of reduce our per capita? Energy um, so we're actually, so we're working on the greenhouse gas inventory updates, and those are looking at 2019 and 2020 numbers, and that looks at your community emissions overall, and then we'll also be looking at your municipal emissions and comparing it to that date, so we'll have some numbers there. Um, what we're seeing now is that not necessarily a lot of, there's some energy that's gone down, the use has gone down, but people are using more energy too. And um, but the energy is is cleaner, so we're seeing big drops in greenhouse gas emissions. But um, 
energy use is not as great. Now, when we were doing the um, facility equipment inventory, we're going out to all the cities and we're looking at the buildings, we're finding a huge amount of lighting that needs to be done still. And we really want to fight for that because a lot of times the CPUC says to us, well, that's going to be covered under Title 24 and, you know, it's taken care of by the market. Well, we know it's not taken care of by the market because cities are not doing huge improvements to their city facilities. So we'll be working on trying to get that as well as HVAC. We're, we might also ask for letters from cities. Yes, and, and, the, and the other thing is for the HVAC, a lot of those units now, they have a Freon in there that can't be replaced anymore. And so when those go out and that, that um, chemical is gone, you're not going to be able to cool your city facility. So there's a lot of work that we need to do. We're trying to offset those costs for the cities, get ahead of it and before something breaks, right? Actually, I mean, I say uh, actually California, because I, I work with uh, AC units, they did come up with a alternate um, to Freon that is actually compatible with the older units. Okay. Yeah. Don't so so. look into that because maybe that's an option for cities to switch them out too. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. But uh, I mean, my question was basically just on a sort of macro scale, right? Right. How ISO measures what our load is each day. The census measures our population. I'm just wondering if at the time we've looked at like, is our load going down versus our population? Okay. I mean, are we... So that's what less the, energy per capita. So that's what the greenhouse gas inventory will do for you as soon as we get that done, and we can present those results to you because it looks at the emission, it looks at the use for the community. As I measure, it's um. How do you we measure? actually so get the load. we get it from the um, Edison and okay. the gas company. So you get actual data, yes, yes. city by city. The data. How much electricity, for example, right. we're using? Okay. Right. City exactly. Forms to give us access. Right. And it's not just municipal operations; it's community wide. Right. We have both. City. Yes, city. we have both. Both and you, city. you know what? I probably we have previous uh, reports that you can look at. So I mean, you can see what we've done in the past, and we're updating what we've done in the past. That's I'm just curious because I mean, we've been working on this for a long time, and I'm so. curious as to whether I'm going to down. And yeah, when we're done, what we can right do is come and present the results. Free city. <laughs> We can report the results. Yeah, for each city. But we're meeting with your city staff also to give them the results. Okay, this we have a very minor okay. thing about the employee manual. So um, we have one revision that we made to the employee manual because we had a sentence in here that was on an annual basis that employees may accrue no more than 120 hours of sick leave. Remember that we had that discussion where we're putting a cap on it, but the word got left in there per year. So it doesn't make sense that they're, they're going to accrue more than 120 hours of sick leave per year because they don't earn that much per year. So we're removing the words per year. And what we did is we we put the wrong uh, copy in the agenda. So we so wanted saw it, it the wrong way that we did the wrong copy in the agenda. But your we, vote was based have, on what we. We don't need to revote on this. No, 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 it's not a revoke. No. So the last thing that I want to just say to you, and then I'm done uh, for the evening, okay. is uh, Eric Rodriguez has been here all night too, and he is graciously, as you can remember, going to be uh, helping us sponsor SCAG to discuss SoCal Connect 5 p.m. at our next board meeting, November 16th. The SoCal Connect is the fancy name that SCAG has given to their regional transportation plan, which comes up every, it's four years, right? Forgetting. And uh, and so um, it's it's important. It's you know, what what trends do they see where they think it's going? And Eric, do you want to say a few words at all? Thank you. Jeff. I appreciate the board uh, for voting to have us uh, participate and um, come in and uh, design the plan. We have Darren Chinzi, who's our chief operating officer. He's actually a South Bay resident. I think he lives in Palos Verdes. So he knows the South Bay very well, and Jackie. So we just wanted to acknowledge that uh, we're only doing two uh, state federal required outreaches. We're doing a couple more throughout the county, but we know how important South Bay City is to the region and to our plan. So we're visiting uh, uh, San Gabriel Valley, and then we're also coming here to the South Bay COG because we know how important you are in terms of uh, you know financial, transportation. You have LAX here, you have the freeway. So we really want to hear from your elected officials, and it's a state requirement, AB 36075, passed in 1998, that requires us to reach with uh, out to our elected officials. So we really want to engage and hear from you, uh, hear any of your comments, and then we'll take those comments back. Um, the is on November 7th, November 2nd, that's where we're coming um, after that. And then 
conclusion will have those comments wrapped up by April of next year. So we appreciate it. And as a thank you, SCAG is providing dinner. So if you have any recommendations, let us know. I'm going to work with Natalie to make sure we get every bed here. And thank you for coming. Yeah. So, I think I think the reason they're really coming is because I speak your mind, right? So you're expecting a lot of comments. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's that completely done. Done. <laughs> Any uh, events or announcement anybody want to make in their cities? Everybody's quiet. We are now. I just Make wanted. <laughs> I just wanted to um, let you guys know that the at least on the the league level, we've been opposing the the zero bail initiative and some of the things that are being put out by the court's administrative officer. And I don't know if ha some of you were on that contract cities call that they facilitated. Um, this man, Mr. Slayton, David Slayton, is not a, an attorney, doesn't have very good legal knowledge about the bail system, actually. And he said some misstatements there. So there's some things that are really problematic with this bail um, system, more than what you know about. And, and it's going to be difficult for uh, the DAs to get an, a, a real hearing at arraignment because once a magistrate decides, oh, there's no money bail, we're going to put conditions you have to find a change of circumstances before you can argue that there needs to be something else done because that's the, the that's the rule. Um, they keep saying, which people need to understand that that it's unconstitutional. There is no case that's controlling on the LA County Superior Court that actually says that. So they this is not a, a legal statement that is actually bound by controlling case law. So these are things that you need to be aware of and collect data because we're um, there. Are, there's about 19 cities that have joined the lawsuit uh, against that have uh, a final injunction against uh, this uh, measure that was led by Whittier. And so their numbers may be growing, but they're, they're, they need data to show how it's been affecting um, public safety in your community. So make sure you have our, your staffs are collecting that data. And as, as of Tuesday, Torrance has joined. Okay. okay. All right, there we go. All righty. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.